Morning, Glory America. Bonjour. Hi, Canada. I'm Hugh Hewitt. I'm not there today. I'm down south. I'm in the deep south today, but for one day. Luckily, we have the one and only Mark Davis up from Dallas, the estimable Mark Davis, to fill in for me. Talk to you about the Cowboys, recognize Ohio State football preeminence, do all the things we do on Friday and have a good time. You're in a pro's, pro's hands. Take it away, Mark. You thank you very, very much. I will try to tick off as many of those things on the list as I can. It's kind of funny because uh, any anytime I fill in for Hugh, he's always suggested that I'm going to pound you with all kinds of uh, minutia about the Dallas Cowboys, which has largely not been true because the Cowboys have been pretty disappointing for a lot of recent history. And then the NFL itself has been so disappointing in some extremely recent history, and I just haven't paid a whole lot of attention, quite frankly. This year, I decided to show some grace. The kneeling has stopped. The Cowboys appear to be actually pretty good, fingers crossed there, as far as recognizing the preeminence of Ohio State. Mm, might might be best to leave that to the master, and uh, Hugh will be back on Monday. So here we are on a Friday. Mark Davis from 660 AM, The Answer, in Dallas-Fort Worth, and I hope that all is well with you. Happy Friday. Happy October. Wow. Three quarters of this year, no math, my understanding is there was to be no math, three quarters of this year is done. How we doing? Because you remember New Year's Eve, <laughs> New Year's Eve seems like five years ago. Even it, It's funny, COVID made 2020 seem like it was three years long. The Biden presidency has made this year seem like it's 20 years long. When When will we get out of this disaster? And that is a lot of where our... Attention is properly focused. Dwayne has fired up so much wonderful audio. I'm going to play a bunch of it for you. I'm here with you for two of the three hours. The third hour is uh, Hugh's always sublime meeting with Larry Arn in the Hillsdale hour. So let's see what we can pack in. Being the first hour, we'll obviously do a little bit of uh, of, of college football uh, with Doug in the, in the final segment. Our buddy Sonny Bunch is going to review a movie or two. But I'll tell you what, I, I'm going to blather about a couple of things. I got a, actually a question or two for Dwayne. And uh, 1-800-520-1234. If you want to hop in and create a little early telephone action, we are ready to accommodate you. 1-800-520-1234. And some of the questions I have, that I, it's funny, I, I have my own show here in DFW every morning. I did the uh, America First with Dr. Gorka yesterday, which is always an adrenaline boost. And, uh, and I was talking to people about the path out of this nightmare. Because let's stipulate that this is the worst presidency of our lifetime. I, and listen, when I, you may not want to stipulate that you may look back, go oh, Nixon uh, and listen, don't, don't get Hugh started on Nixon. Yeah, that did not end well, but Nixon was a genius in so many ways. Uh, and as far as Clinton and Obama, the other contenders, uh, after just a, a fraction of a year of these people, Obama seems positively innocuous and, and Clinton seems positively Churchillian and I've run that by some people. Dwayne, welcome. How you doing? It's great to be hanging out with you guys, as, as always. always. Appreciate as always. it. Appreciate yes. it. Um, I, I got a few more years on the planet than you do, but uh, is, is it too glib to, to conclude this early worst presidency ever, or at least in the lifetime of anyone listening? Certainly. I mean, I, I am not a historian, but I have studied a lot of history doing this show for 20 plus years. It will happen. Uh, you got to go back to Buchanan. <laughs> to, to, you know, and, and Buchanan, you know, holds a very special place as as being a, a fairly ineffectual president, being that he basically got us into a civil war and all. Yeah. Um, Joe Biden is awfully bad everywhere you look, whether it's immigration, whether it's the debacle on the spending bills, whether it's the the, the catastrophic Afghanistan uh, uh, Afghanistan. Uh, debacle mm -hmm. uh we have done th something here in afghanistan that this country has never done which is leave a countless amounts of americans and green card holders behind uh it's it's just a train wreck wherever you look so the next question is it's all it, his name is on the administration so it, it accrues to his reputational detriment but now it's kind of a parlor game because we'll i don't think we'll ever really know is is he doing all these things? Are there invisible hands? Are there marionette strings attached to him? And if so, from where? Kamala Harris, Nancy Pelosi, Chuck Schumer, the squad. I don't know. Somebody yesterday said, I'll tell you what it is, Mark, because you don't hear him from very much. It's Obama. And I rejected this completely. Obama this week stepped forward to say, 
that open borders are unsustainable. And, and I, I just said, I almost said, sir, I miss you. And I, of course, mean that hugely tongue in cheek. Everything's everything's relative, as I said. Um, I, th- I, I, I think, think Obama's enjoying his current life on his terms. There, there's no way Obama wants to bury his days in Zoom meetings with the inner cabal to run the Biden presidency. Yeah, you see, so, I don't think that's the case. I think what's going on is Joe Biden is the one that is making the decisions. He yeah. is just an infirm old man. And he has a staff around him that are trying to protect him and isolate him to try to keep the world from seeing how infirm he is. Then did, has the cognitive decline, which which Hugh has very tactfully defined, because no one here is a neurologist, we can't diagnose, but we've all seen it. We've all seen the glaze in the eyes, and our our loved ones and relatives, we've all seen the occasional... You see the 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 clips even when he was vice president on YouTube. Thank you, exactly. This is not reckless. Right. uh, Back in his vice president days, he would be uh, peppered with questions, and he could respond right away and carry a a cogent thought. He was wrong on policy. He's always been wrong on policy. But he was coherent. But he was coherent. You could at least understand a sentence he was trying to make. He stumbles so much now trying to reach for a thought. He is an infirm old man. He just has slowed down. part of that decline, if if your theory is correct, that it really is him, that it's hard to imagine that that he has his actual hands on the levers, but if it really is him, is part of this decline uh, an enormous pendulum sh- shift to the left? Because this, this not only is this not cognitively the Joe, the Joe Biden of 20 years ago, it's not ideologically the Joe Biden of 20 years ago, I don't think. Well, it's not ideologically the Joe Biden we've known, but what we do know about Joe Biden, and this has been so for darn near 50 years, he has zero political instincts. They've always been off. He has been off on every foreign policy decision, famously said by former Defense Secretary Robert Gates, you know, for 40 years. He has no political instincts. And as poor as his political instincts are, Kamala Harris is worse. Yep. Yep. Which is why, just to wrap this up, and then we'll get into the next segment, some of the wonderful, wonderful audio and video you have loaded from some of the budget struggles and some some fascinating uh, abortion issue testimony yesterday and a number of things that we'll examine. If anybody wants to join us early on, we're glad to talk to some folks in the first hour. 1-800-520-1234. 1-800-520-1234. So a lot of people are wondering, can this Biden presidency actually last? They, the you know, impeachment is in the wind. I don't know if I want to mess with that. Maybe, no, I don't. You know, you know, we, Clinton got impeached once, Andrew Johnson once, Trump twice, whatever. I think the, the country is impeachment weary. There's zero chance of him being removed from office. So let's just not even do that. It makes us look petty. It makes us look distracted. Uh, 25th Amendment, who knows? I don't think at any point his own cabinet is going to throw him under the bus. So I believe we are going to wheeze through this term of Joe Biden and then just please let us focus, we focus, have focus to on get, the future. We have to get the House back. Yep. Keep the Senate so that there's at least a check so that he can limit the damage he can do. And then you've got uh, in 24, uh, there's no way that Joe Biden's going to be the nominee in 24. I I would be stunned. I would be stunned if he's got the energy to try to go through another national campaign again. Will he even run? Right. I mean, or, or, and, and listen, I think people will get with him and say, Joe, if I you're think thinking it's an about open running, seat. stop it. I think it's a totally open seat because nobody wants the spectacle of a weakened, rudderless Joe Biden being humiliated by being denied the nomination by right. his own party. Right. Someone will get a hold of him. So uh, I think what's going to happen is by the time we get to the midterms, if the sentiment, if the poll numbers Inflation uh, comes roaring in in 22, which is expected, especially Mm -hmm. if we dump $5 trillion on the economy. All this stuff goes on, and if they get hammered, Democrats get hammered in the 22 midterms, Joe Biden's presidency at that point is effectively over. He is a lame duck at that point. One can only hope. And and interestingly, we spend so much time, especially here in conservative talk radio, talking about the 2024 field. For our side, if what we've just spent time talking about is true, what, 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 what about... 
the, the Democrat Party. I don't think Kamala Harris inherits this nomination. Are you kidding? Uh, her popularity is 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 in the tank. She's just not good. She's not politically skilled. She's a she crushing disappointment. She didn't make it out of Iowa. Exactly right. And so that can't be her. So do we open up the possibility that Democrats may, I mean, rank and file Democrats, just voters who happen to vote Democrat, might say, listen, there's so much attention to your mansions and your cinemas. Maybe it's time for a Democrat nominee that's not a bug-eyed socialist radical. <laughs> well, you would think, wouldn't you? Except, would, one would think, but I don't strategize for them. I, I don't know. I, I, considering the squad's uh, power right now and Bernie Sanders and the media, it's it's hard to see them coming, uh, coming to yeah. grips. DeSantis and Ayanna Presley, 2024. Who's with me? All right, all right. I'm Mark Davis in for Hugh. Sit tight. Much more to come. Portions of the Hugh Hewitt Show are brought to you by Alliance Defending Freedom. Streaming on Salem Now. The most powerful organs of the state are not merely corrupt, but that they've been weaponized. We are now all rooting for his success. That's not what happened. It was a complete ambush. I thought it's early enough. Let's just send a couple guys over. And the audience was, ha, 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 ha. How funny to set up an innocent man. This is what third world security states do. They spy on their political opponents like this. This is part of a concerted uh, Russian influence operation. Russians, I'm not going to be specific as... He knew he could just say it on TV and then hide behind, well, it's all classified, I can't get into it. It divided the country in ways that people can't imagine. It's inspired massive violence. It's given people who are bad faith actors a license to do whatever they want. Look for Salem Now in the App Store or go to SalemNow.com. Trending now on the Charlie Kirk Show. We now have what would only possibly be explained as a refugee camp somewhere out of Syria or Somalia in our own country in Del Rio, Texas. Now, Del Rio, Texas is right across the border from Mexico. Mexico has no desire or interest to actually secure the southern border on their side, unlike under President Trump, who actually negotiated a deal and threatened tariffs. And as soon as President Trump threatened a 5% tariff, Mexico came straight to the table and they started to try to secure the southern border. Now, we have manufactured mayhem right now in Del Rio, Texas. And the only reason we know anything about it is thanks to Fox News and one drone that flew... Keep up with what's trending. Subscribe on YouTube today. Trending now on the Dennis Prager Show. We meet the threat of challenging climate, the challenging climate we're all feeling, already ravaging every part of our world with extreme weather. Or will we suffer the merciless march of ever worsening droughts and floods? more intense fires and hurricanes, longer heat waves, and rising seas. It's, uh, it, it's something that I broadcast regularly, Bjorn Lomberg and others who actually report on the science, that a lot of what he just said isn't true, but it doesn't matter because the left believes it, the left owns the media, and so people believe it. Keep up with what's trending. Subscribe on YouTube today. This is Carol Platt Lebow for townhall.com. It's not surprising that Joe Biden wants to turn the page on his incompetent withdrawal from Afghanistan and the abandonment of U.S. citizens and our allies there. Almost as unsurprising as the media's craven effort to help him. Even as Americans remain hostage in Afghanistan and the Taliban flaunts the military equipment we left them, the news has shifted to other domestic stories. It's inexplicable. Their silence is a scandal. But sadly, we've grown used to seeing the media try to influence public opinion in a way that benefits their chosen candidates. Let's hope that this time, Americans see through the manipulation. So long as America is being humiliated by a group of Taliban savages and our fellow citizens or captives, we deserve the full story. 
We should demand that the media give it to us. I'm Carol platt Liebau. The Pepperdine Graduate School of Public Policy. For those considering careers in politics and policy. Trending now on The Larry Elder Show. Colorado. And she told Cheryl Atkinson that in November, listen to this. And this isn't this isn't a one this isn't a one off. She told Cheryl Atkinson that back in November she processed a murder suicide case. The very next day, that murder suicide case showed up on the state website as a COVID death. Keep up with what's trending. Subscribe on YouTube and at rumble.com. A nice beginning to our Friday music library. Roberta Flack and the great Donny Hathaway, Where is the Love from 1972? And since it's me, you've got a lot of birthdays, a lot of chart history. Every tune has a reason. Donny Hathaway would have been 76 today, passed away at 33 back in 1979. Great Donny Hathaway. All right, uh, 1-800-520-1234. We're going to go to some calls here in just a moment on the Hugh Hewitt Show. Mark Davis filling in. Quick bit of audio real quick um, and video for those watching there at HughHewitt.com. Dwayne and I were just talking about who might, in a wide-open Democrat field for 2024, presuming there is one, uh, would it be dyed-in-the-wool familiar names for a long time or some of these new fresh faces like maybe a Kirsten Cinema of Arizona? Ro Khanna. Uh, Cal- uh, he views himself quite the grizzled Damn veteran there in, uh, in California. Uh, here is uh, Ro uh, with a little just 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 pure envy of uh, Kirsten Cinema. Watch this. You know, Senator Cinema is being treated like a head of state. I've, I've never requested or met with the president in the Oval Office. I meet with his staff. She meets with him like every other day. And then she has a whole presidential delegation. Ricchetti and Susan Rice all go to her office. And all we want to know is what does she want? I mean, she's a first-term senator, and she hasn't put out a framework yet. Well, actually. Well, well, well exactly. <laughs> she's a first-term senator who has made herself distinctive by showing maybe another way to be a Democrat. And, and I'm not suggesting that she is a reincarnation of the Scoop Jackson, JFK, you know, Joe Lieberman style of Democrat, but it is decidedly different. All right, 1-800-520-1234. Uh, let us roll to Pennsylvania. And Gary, that is you. Welcome. You are on the Hugh Hewitt Show. Very nice to have you. Mark Davis filling in. Happy Friday. Thank you. My, my question is, uh, I think there should be a certain age, like 65 for presidents and all these people that's going on. 65? Way out of hand. Dude, I'm 63. Think, <laughs> I'm, I'm well, teasing. yeah, but you got more common sense than <laughs> Half of these people. Is You're very on. kind, which kind of proves my point. There are people, and, and God bless Chuck Grassley. He's 88 and running for another six year term. That's beyond the pale, even though Chuck Grassley is more coherent than Biden on a good day. I, you know, I, I don't know. I, if, as soon as you, any age limit's going to be arbitrary. I mean, what should it be? You know, 75, 80? I don't know. I, I'd like to think that people who are too old would be found out by the electorate, but and yet there's Biden. There you are. Yep, yep. You see yep, so that. It's, <laughs> yeah, it's 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 tricky. It's tricky. I appreciate it. Thank you. Let's head uh, elsewise in Pennsylvania. Drew. Hey. Uh hang on a second. Hey, hey Mark Davis good in morning, for you. Mark. How you doing, Drew? Nice to hear you. Good. Hey, I'm just, you know, concerned probably like a lot of other people. Are we past that tipping point of the country? Do we, how do we recover? Oh, it's there it, there's an Answer that's easy to say, and it's hard to do. Are we past the tipping point? Have we gone too far? Is there no way back? The first thing let's plow through is the notion of election security because people do, in principle, say there's no way out if we can't trust our elections. So we have to be able to trust our elections. I'm coming to you from my great state of Texas where we have enacted election security legislation that has the left throwing conniption fits and having nervous breakdowns every day, which proves to me that we're on to something. Other states are doing the same thing. So if we cross our fingers really tight and pray really hard for an election cycle in 22 and 24 whose results we can trust, then we go to the, the usual solutions, which are run the best kind of candidates and hope that the public has its eyes open 
and, and, and will end this nightmare. Two things are necessary to do that. Let me know what you think about both. One, to have Republican victories in 22 and 24, conservatives have to be energized. We have to have candidates that are absolutely energizing to the conservative base. Second thing we've got to do is have voters in the mushy middle, independents, non-ideological folks, moderates, whatever. They have to objectively look at the country and realize that we're not being run well that this Biden presidency has been an abject failure so that they just kind of go, eh, let's give some other people a shot. If both of those things happen, hope springs eternal. But when, when, when the narrative is controlled by the internet, the TV, things that people see, that really concerns me. There's a, it, it, it should. I mean, we've had media bias at the poisonous level since Reagan. Everything you've described was true in 2016, and Trump won – so if that just means we got to fight harder because we don't control uh, the media, we don't control Hollywood, we don't control, you know, big tech, that's okay. That's okay. I think we can win anyway. Let's uh, fight hard and fight smart. Mark Davison for Hugh Hewitt. Stick around. Much more to come on this Friday, October 1st. Portions of the Hugh Hewitt Show are brought to you in part by Birch Gold Group. Trending now on The Mike Gallagher Show. With the vice president of the United States, the border czar, she's the one that Biden tasked with fixing the border. Wow, she's doing a heck of a job, isn't she? This is what she's upset about. What I saw depicted about um, those individuals on horseback treating human beings the way they were is horrible. And um, I fully support what is happening right now, which is a thorough investigation into exactly what is going on there. Um, But human beings should never be treated that way. And I'm deeply troubled about it. The whole point is that we have to understand Haiti. I mean, talk about a country that has just experienced so much uh, tragedy that has been about natural disasters and we really have to do a lot more to recognize that as a member of the Western Hemisphere we've got to support some very basic needs that the people of Haiti have to get back up this is like right out of a comic book or a movie or a, or a novel about an inept comical uh, egregiously corrupt administration you're going to be you're going to investigate the border patrol agent on the horse why don't you are you still what are you still looking for the root cause of the problem kamala are you still looking for that she's a little bit like oj simpson looking for nicole's killer on the golf courses of las vegas he's still on that search you know for the real killer of nicole and ron goldman Keep up with what's trending. Subscribe on YouTube and at rumble.com. The Democratic Party somehow has convinced black people that they're the good guys, never mind the skanky history of the Democratic Party. That was a party of slavery. There is a whole big uh, cottage industry for racism. If racism went away, a lot of people would be unemployed. The mob during the Minneapolis riots following the death of George Floyd, a bunch of white thugs, frankly, burning down the city's traditional black and Asian business. They're racist. Racist, racist, everything's racist. Look for Salem Now in the App Store or go to SalemNow.com. Trending now on America First with Sebastian Berka. There is one who's worse than all the rest, and that's Mayorkas, the Secretary of Homeland Security, because he came here as a Cuban refugee, as a child, and he told the Cubans who want freedom in Cuba today to stay in that stinking communist hellhole as he keeps the southern border uh, um, uh, open wide. Do you, am I, what, do, you, do you agree? Is he perhaps the worst of the worst? Oh, yeah. I, for a few reasons, not only what you just said, but... He's a secretary of Homeland Security. His job is secure the border, and he hasn't taken one action to slow the flow. The, everything they've been working on is processing people quicker yeah. and releasing them quicker. Yeah. They haven't done a single thing to stop the flow. Yeah. And so he, he's ignored his oath of office. And I'll tell you, when he was deputy secretary, I worked for him. And, and we had a surge in FY15 under President Obama. We built thousands of family beds. We held people to see a judge. Most lost their cases, and we deported them. So he, he knows, knows he knows what it takes. 
He knows exactly the steps needed to stop this, and he's refusing to do any of it. So, you know, he's no longer a sec- he's a Secretary of Homeland Insecurity because we're less secure now than we ever have been. The hu- oh, and and wow. the man to stand on national TV every day and see this border is say it's secure and it's closed, and the men and women at Green are looking at him as their boss saying, wait a minute. We're busting our butts down here. We're getting sick. This is unprecedented numbers. We got parts of the borders where there's nobody even patrolling. And yeah. you don't go on national TV and say we're not dealing with this. We, we, we're, we're in some kind of nightmare where this, this, this crisis isn't really happening. It's an insult to the men and women who put their lives on the line every single day. It's perfectly put. Uh, Alejandro Mayorkas is the Secretary of Homeland in security. <laughs> Keep up with what's trending. Subscribe today at Rumble.com. Trending now on The Charlie Kirk Show. That there is a way that this could all be solved. That actually Republican states have the ability to solve this if they wanted to. Put Mayorkas aside. Put the Biden bashing aside. I'm kind of tired of that, aren't you? I'm fatigued with governors going on cable television and saying, Biden regime is terrible and we need, okay, enough of that, okay? Do something about it. And in fact, Texas showed that you can do something about it. If it gets so bad, it seemed as if local government stepped up and they secured the border. They created almost a perimeter around the Haitian criminal camp of border jumpers that have tried to come into our country. Now, some people in the media are saying, well, these are refugees. No, they are not. A refugee is someone who comes from a war-torn country that is facing imminent death or their neighborhood or their home has been bombed thousands of, I don't think thousands, probably 1,800 miles all the way to the eastern shore of Mexico, then to the border. Who's paying for this? Keep up with what's trending. Subscribe on YouTube today. I know I could have done American Pie, could have done Vincent, went for a little castles in the air for Don McLean. It is McLean, not McLean, correct? Let's uh, notify him. And if we do, let's say happy birthday. Don McLean is 76 today, little castles in the air. In 60 seconds, we're going to say hi to Sonny Bunch, talk some pop culture, some movies. First, let me tell you about your freedoms as we get ready to head into the weekend. Pause for a moment. Consider the blessing that we all enjoy with our constitutionally guaranteed liberties, which we have at least for the moment. Free speech, freedom of religion, sanctity of life. Your rights are real, and they are under attack. Did you catch it? Hugh chronicled this so well that that a leading candidate for governor of Virginia stunned the debate audience by saying he was proud to have vetoed legislation that would have alerted parents when there was sexually explicit content in instructional materials. That was Terry McAuliffe. And, and asked to clarify that, he said if elected governor, he would not let parents tell schools what to teach. That is now the stuff of legend. Protecting our cherished freedoms from government interference, including our, our parental rights that we cherish, is why it's so urgent that you join me in supporting Alliance Defending Freedom. Go to HughHewitt.com, click on the Alliance Defending Freedom banner, and if your rights as a parent are worth $100 to defend, I think they are, click on that and go all in for a $100 donation this morning to the Freedom Fund to help ADF continue fighting pivotal court battles and be ready when your freedoms are threatened as well. The Constitution doesn't get suspended during a pandemic. ADF, Alliance Defending Freedom, is always there to be ready to help you or your college-age student or your church. So right now today, go to HughHewitt.com, click on the ADF banner at the top of the page. That's HughHewitt.com, and click on the ADF banner or go on the phone to 866-359-359. 9644. HughHewitt.com. Click the ADF banner. Our friends at Alliance Defending Freedom. Here's a friend of the show, a segment I always enjoy when Hugh does it, and what a joy for me to be able to do it, filling in. Sonny Bunch is here. Hey, Sonny, good morning. How are you doing, sir? I'm good, Mark. How are you? I'm fantastic. Great to hear from you. And as I ask what is in the pipeline that you'd like to draw some attention to today, I want to ask you as a critic, as a maven, as a, an, a consumer of the culture, where you stand on the notion of the experience of consuming new film 
in in big theaters versus just sitting in your living room and streaming them. Life is different for you. It's different for all of us in this last year and a fraction. Yeah, it's been weird uh, trying to figure out how to get folks back into the theaters. And, you know, the, the studios have been kind of helpful with this, but not, not entirely. Uh, you know, for instance, one of the things I, I want to talk about today, The Many Saints of Newark, is available simultaneously on HBO Max uh, and in theaters. Uh, and HBO Max has done this several times. Warner Brothers, uh, of course, kind of famously put their whole slate uh, simultaneously on HBO Max and in theaters this year. Uh, and the, they, they've done this several times now, most recently with Cry Macho. I don't know if you saw Cry Macho, um, the, the new Clint Eastwood, but it, is, it was available in theaters and on HBO Max simultaneously. And what, what we have seen basically every time they have done this uh, is that people have chosen to stay at home and watch things at home. Um, if they watch them at all, uh, you know, it's, it's not, it's, we don't have any real good numbers on, on what sort of traffic, uh, what sort of ratings HBO max is getting. But, uh, uh, the, the, the folks have not necessarily shown up in theaters. I mean, I think cry macho did like 5 million bucks opening weekend. Yeah. It's, it's, it's first weekend, which is not great. Um, so the, 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 the trick of getting folks back into, into theaters is, is twofold. Really. Their, their first is the safety discussion. You know, people, People still worried about the disease. People still worried about COVID, uh, you know, which I un- understood more uh, kind of at the beginning of this than I do at this point. You know, if you're vaccinated and, and most people are vaccinated and most people who are worried about coronavirus are vaccinated, you know, you're, you're going to be fine, especially in a movie theater, which is not right. uh, by its nature a very dangerous place. I mean, it just the the. I mean, literally just the shape of the room, the size of the ceilings, you know, how spread out everyone is, yes. especially in the newer auditoriums with the big plush seating, you know, um, uh, and everybody facing the same way, facing, you know, looking at the screen, nobody's really talking. It's just not, it's not a place where there is, uh, there has been a ton of, of COVID spread found, period, in, no. in the contact tracing literature so there's there's that there's that element and then there's also the convenience element this is the the hbo max dilemma uh, also the disney plus premier access dilemma and all, all right. the other day and date as they call it uh we're we're uh, we convenience at we're convenience addicts and i'm not immune i've been into an actual big theater precisely twice in the last year and a half all both of them in the last three or four months one for uh, for quiet place two and for black widow and I loved, I think I loved both experiences more because it was a big screen with big sound. And I got a pretty sweet setup at the house, but I still love going into that. And, and both theaters had like 12 people in them because everybody's terrified. I, I'm an enormous advocate for, for not losing from our culture the big theater experience, the communal viewing, which I think we've largely lost. Yeah. I mean, the communal viewing aspect is important, I think, just, especially for some movies like uh, Quiet Place Part Two, where, you know, you've got scares and you've got you know people gasping all at the same time uh the other i mean the other issue here is you mentioned the big screen and the big sound and all that and that's true that is absolutely uh a a big part of the theatrical viewing experience for sure but one one thing that i think is underrated and underappreciated is the is not just the is not just the big screen and the viewing things together but also the isolation and what i mean is like you are away from your phone. You have mm-hmm. your phone, but you're not looking at your phone, you yep. know, for, for that two hours because you're hopefully a good person who is, you know, not, not, you know, texting and calling people in a movie theater. Right. But, right. you know, but like you don't have, you don't have your laptop there to check your email, you know, check your work, work slacks and that sort of thing. Right. It's, it's, uh, it's your, you're focused on the screen. You're focused on what's happening on the screen. That just makes for a better viewing you know what? experience. Better... Having, having you mention that, it just it just gave another value here that is contrary to modern human nature. Is you're not in control when you're in a theater. You can't pause it and check a football score. You have willingly sub- subjugated your priorities, and you're going to say, "I'm going to walk into this room. I'm going to sit down for two hours or whatever, and I'm going to let it wash over me. I'm going to relinquish this this control juice that usually flows through my veins." And I think there's psychological value in doing that every once in a while. Absolutely. And, uh, you know, I, I understand the argument that, uh, you know, people want to pause to be able to go to the bathroom. Of sure. I, I, yeah. I also, you know, <laughs> occasionally, every once in a while in the theater after a, you know, giant 70 ounce, 
you know, soda. Depth charge size whatever. iced tea, I'll, exactly. <laughs> exactly. I'll want to exactly. head to the bathroom myself, but it, it, I agree. I mean, it, it is, there's something to be said for just uh, to, to giving up a little bit of control and letting the art take over. Well, I didn't mean to bog down, but I was fascinated. So let's get to what you did want to talk about. I'm fascinated. I'm, of course, as the law requires, a huge Sopranos fan. Many Saints of Newark is a prequel. Does it work? Well, it's interesting. So uh, the many, as you say, so the Many Saints of Newark is a it's a soprano story, right? It's uh, yeah. a prequel to to what happened on the show. Uh, the action takes place. It starts in 1968, 1967, something like that, in Newark, uh, and the Vietnam War is the backdrop. You know, there are race riots in Newark, that sort of thing. Um, and there are two. There are kind of two separate movies at war with each other in this, in this picture. The first is a like fairly, uh, it's nostalgic. There's a, there's a nostalgia trip, uh, to this, to, uh, see the younger versions of like Silvio Dante or Polly Walnuts, uh, you know, or, or Livia Soprano, those guys, those, those characters to see them at their, as, as, you know, younger characters, and I don't think that part of the movie really works. It feels, it almost feels like David Chase is kind of making fun of us a little bit, I think. Really? Um, in what way? And then, yeah, I mean, it's, it's, I, I, that's probably too harsh of a way to put it, mm-hmm. but just, I mean, the, the, uh, I, there's nothing to call it except for the impression that the character who was playing Silvio Dante does of Steve Van Zandt playing Silvio Dante. Gotcha. Is, is I understand. Gotcha. Kind of cringy. Okay. It's just yes. cringy. Um, uh, but then there's a second story, which is a, which, which feels like a more original, um, kind of more interesting story that, uh, Chase is trying to tell about, you know, I, I don't know, race in America, whatever, but it, so it, that is about, uh, Dickie Moltisanti, who is Chris, Christopher Moltisanti's father. Um, if you, if folks, fans of the, uh, fans of the show will remember Christopher Moltisanti as the. A cousin of Tony Soprano, who right, Tony, Michael Imperioli, uh, right. mm-hmm. yeah, played by Michael Imperioli, who you know Tony kills in the final season after a, a car accident. Um, uh, he, Dicky, is trying to, uh, he, you know, he's trying to be a good mobster, but also a good person. He's trying to, he's trying to, you know, lead a lead a good life. He's trying to steer uh, Tony Soprano, who's played by Michael Gandolfini, uh, away from the the life of crime that he will wind up in. Uh, and, uh, Dickie is, is forced to go to go to mob war with a, uh, uh an African American mobster played by Leslie Odom jr. Name of Harold McBrayer in this film. And, you know, it's, it's like the black gangs versus the Italian gangs with the backdrop, uh, of all of the, the race stuff in Newark. It's pretty interesting. That part of it is pretty interesting. Um, but the, the, the Soprano stuff is, again, it's, it's a little, it just feels it feels uh, forced and and kind of uh, again it's it is nostalgia and not the good kind and I think again I think Chase understands this and is kind of skeptical of it uh, and and I think he's winking at us that you know this is this is not necessarily what he wanted to do but it's it's what he was allowed to do. I think and in our final in our final thirty seconds, does young Gandolfini pull it off? You know, he, uh, he, he does. He's very good. And, and, and he's, the, the ads for this have been a little bit misleading because mm-hmm. he's only really in about the last half of the movie. Okay. Gotcha. Um, the, the first half of the movie, young, young Tony Soprano is much younger. He's, he's like elementary school age. Well, I will tell you, your review of it has done what a good review should. It has made me want to see it even more. As your writing and uh, speaking tends to do, the great Sonny Bunch at the Bulwark, at Sonny Bunch on Twitter. Thanks, sir. Mark Davis. Let's do a little college football. It's my bad Keith Jackson as Doug joins us next on the Hugh Hewitt Show. Don't go anywhere. I'm not there, but before I left you in the hands of the very competent and estimable Mark Davis, I can't do a market update for you because I'm doing this on Thursday. And when I left, gold was at about 1740 an ounce. It may have gone up a little bit or a little down a little bit, but it's in a great buy zone and it has been for weeks. Maybe you've been saving up to do that because you want to take advantage of it because you believe like I do. The next week when the monstrosity passes, the inflation starts to roar in. The monstrosity being the three and a half trillion that the Democrats want to pump in, or even the little monster, the one and a half trillion that they want to put into infrastructure. Either way, it's printed money. Either way, it makes the real currency get less valuable unless you own gold. 
To diversify, go over to HughGold.com, that's HughGold.com, and get the brochure free of charge from Birch Gold on how to acquire gold. Either you can roll over a portion of your IRA or 401k, or you can buy it direct. Or text my name, Hugh, 474747. Also, if you're spending the weekend on a Friday and you're going to be doing something fun like I am, running around the South, get yourself some relieffactor.com. Now, you hear me talk about it three times a day, even when I'm not there, even when Mark Davis is filling in for me. That's because I take it every day. I took it this morning in South Carolina. I will be taking it again the next day in South Carolina. I'll take it when I come back to Virginia. Relieffactor.com is part of everybody's essential supplemental diet. Now take your vitamin, take anything your doctor prescribes for you, but don't forget. A carrion, curcumin, resveratrol, and omega are the four natural ingredients that combine to work against the inflation that occurs in your body because you're getting older, more importantly because you're exercising, whether it's 100 steps or 10,000. Whether you're going to run 10 miles or just go to the grocery store. Whatever you do, keep moving. Keep moving without pain with relieffactor.com. That's relieffactor.com. And come right back for more of Mark Davis right here on The Hugh Hewitt Show. Tell them now. The public would be outraged if they knew the truth. Politicians are not on the sidewalk right now talking to you. I don't have no respect. The old wall randomly turns into a guardrail, followed by miles of open border. You might have got to That journey is extremely dangerous. The seven-year-old girl died in the desert. From the country of India. A great pillar of the community was killed by a man who had been deported at least twice. This little urn contains the ashes of my son. His dreams cut short forever. We're so worried about other countries' problems, and we don't even focus on our own. Look for Salem Now in the App Store, or go to SalemNow.com. Trending now on The Dennis Prager Show. Because if America is not the world's policeman, there are two things that will happen. Bad people will become the world's policemen, or there will be no policemen and they will be just mass evil. I, I, so I, I fully plead guilty to the belief that America has a moral role to play in this world. And especially when it is at such little sacrifice as it was for the last couple of years in Afghanistan. We lost more people to the to the suicide bombing oh, when uh, Joe Biden said we would leave. In that day, we lost more servicemen than in the last year and a half, all put together. Uh, we're opening a new era of relentless diplomacy. Is there anybody who uh, understands what that means? Relentless diplomacy with whom? With the Taliban? Yeah. That's actually one of those that he has in mind. Using the power of our development aid to invest in new ways of lifting people up around the world. I must admit that I didn't understand most of his speech. That is one of the sentences. I have no idea what he was talking about. Number 23. Over the last eight months, I prioritized rebuilding our alliances, revitalizing our partnerships, and recognizing they're essential and central to America's enduring security and prosperity. We have reaffirmed our sacred NATO alliance to Article 5 commitment. Hmm. How many people in that audience understood Article 5 commitment? But in any event... Keep up with what's trending. Subscribe on YouTube today. Trending now on the mic this most amazing discoveries thought to be written in a lost journal now in the right hands it could revolutionize the 21st century you can stop an earthquake doesn't that mean you could start one too that, that's why that notebook should never fall into the wrong hands shall we stop this thing save, save the universe, universe. <sighs> look for salem now in the app store go to salemnow.com
Little Vintage Police, first album, Outlandos the Amor. Why? Because it's Sting's birthday. How old? Three guesses. 70. Sting is 70 tomorrow, reaching into the uh, the weekend for some birthdays and reaching into the world of college football. What a pleasure it is to say hi to Doug LeMarie's, Cleveland.com, all kinds of blogging, all kinds of podcasting. I love this segment. I love it, Doug. Welcome. Nice to have you. Mark Davis down here in Texas. But I have a responsibility. When you and Hugh get together, there is an infusion of Ohio Buckeye State love. So I have questions uh, as if you were still here, as if you were actually still doing the show So, Doug, how can we displace the 10 pretenders ranked ahead of Ohio State so they can be awarded the national championship that is their birthright? Well, there are some interesting games coming up that could displace some people, but Ohio State is also looking better, right? People aren't used to Ohio State. Yes, they are. Objectively, I will admit they absolutely are. There, There is chaos in college football, which people are very accustomed to the same team making the playoff every year. And this feels like a year where it's not going to be the same teams. And we saw one of those teams probably get kicked out last week in Clemson, who had made the previous six college football playoffs. They lost in double overtime to NC State. A two-loss team has never made the college football playoff. They're already two and two. I think Clemson's done. So that's one team probably displayed. And and so what is the reason? Do they just miss Trevor Lawrence that much? Are they now just, uh, pardon the usage here for Clemson, a paper tiger? Well done. Uh, DJ Uyunglele is a, a five-star quarterback, but he has never looked comfortable all year. There are questions about their offensive line this year, but, but Mark, this happens when a powerhouse struggles. People are wondering, is their offense stale? What they've done for so long, does it still work? So there are some fundamental questions. Of course, they miss Trevor Lawrence, but they had a guy, a second-year guy who was highly rated, ready to step in, and it it hasn't worked so far. So I think they have to look inside a little bit and see if they have to, you know, run things a little differently on offense. Let's take a look at the NFL slate. I'm going to channel Hugh for my second question. How many points will the Browns be favored by in the Super Bowl? You know, I, I, I have also asked that question this year. People in Cleveland I'm playing are with you. I, I know you mean, uh, I'm playing with you. <laughs> very excited. Um, well, the, listen, the, the, Browns, Brown, the Browns are great. The, the Browns are at Minnesota. I would think that's yeah. a W. Would, would, would we not? I actually think the Browns are going to lose this week. It's it's Whoa, why? It's, M- Minnesota has looked uh, really good. They probably should be 2-1 and one or 3-0. and oh. They're 1-2. and two. Mm-hmm. They missed a field goal to lose a game. Kevin Stefanski, the Browns coach, spent 14 years as an assistant in Minnesota. I think that's got to get to you, Mark. You're going back it to does. Minnesota for the first time. Pull on the yep. heartstrings a little bit. I wonder. And then the Minnesota just has a very efficient offense that gets the ball out quickly, negates the Miles Garrett pass rush. I think the Vikings win this week. There is something about when when a player or a coach returns to a, an area of, of past triumphs and how that works out. Brady going back to Foxborough would be interesting, except the Patriots simply are not that good anymore. Well, it's hard because Mac Jones, their rookie quarterback, who was Alabama last year, I mean, he – He's a little bit of a of a Tom Brady clone, and get but guess what? He's a rookie quarterback, and all the rookie quarterbacks in the NFL are having a tough time so far this year. That includes Trevor Lawrence. That includes Justin Fields from Ohio State last year. Zach Wilson from BYU. Nobody's looking great. It's a tough spot for Mac Jones, but again, the Patriots. Sometimes you think that Patriots magic is going to be in there. Bill Belichick is the greatest coach in NFL history, but. They still don't look like themselves. A lot of people were high on the Patriots this year. Kind of hasn't looked that way so far. Let me do one self-serving thing for folks who who know me. We just don't know what to do here in Cowboys land. We've been so starred for upper echelons of success for a quarter century. Two and one. Dak looks great coming back from a horrible injury. We we got to win this dreadful NFC East. But how 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 deeply dare we dream in Cowboys land? You know, I think when you have Dak. You always have a chance. I, he's he's a, a top five quarterback when healthy. When you add Tony Pollard to Ezekiel Elliott in that backfield, I think the explosiveness outside with uh, C.D. Lamb as a young receiver complimenting Amari Cooper and those guys. You know, Jalen Smith is a great linebacker. Sometimes you wonder, can the defense do its job as the offense piles up points? As you said, the NFC East is not very good. So I do think, <laughs> You know, once you get to the playoffs and you get to the Rams and the Bucks and some other really good teams in the NFC, maybe the Cowboys are in trouble. I think they have a really good chance to win that division, though. If that helps, does that help at all? 
Does that help it is. It, that is I, it absolutely does. It, it, it delivers a kind of the cautious optimism, which I already was beginning to feel. So, Doug, listen, I love this segment when Hugh does it. What a pleasure it is to meet you and say hi and send everybody to Cleveland.com, to the to the CFB Playoff Show, to your Twitter feed there at Doug LeMarie's, L-E-S-M-E-R-I-S-E-S. There will be a quiz. It is wonderful to meet you, sir. Thanks for being on. Mark, very fun. All the best. You betcha, Doug Marie's. I love this because, because as as Hugh properly says on Fridays, I mean, you know, are, are we going to do are we going to do you know debt limit uh, all three hours uh, all week long? Friday, we're we're going to some movies. We're going to do some sports, but hey, the first hour is done. So now we're going to do a little bit of heavy lifting. We are going to talk a little bit about the disasters that Biden has taken us toward militarily, fiscally culturally and we'll start to do it when we return for hour number two of the hugh hewitt show mark davis filling in glad you are here happy friday and happy october portions of the hugh hewitt show are brought to you in part by simon and schuster's enemy at the gates the latest in the vince flynn series by kyle mills trending now on the mike gallagher show It's hard not to weep for our country right now, isn't it? When you see these images of thousands of thousands of people camped out under makeshift uh, sticks and branches and trees, it does look like a third world nation. It's Del Rio, Texas. It's the state of Texas in the United States of America. This is not a, we're not a third world nation. But my Lord, we're being turned into one. And the assertion that this is intentional on the part of this Biden-Harris administration is very hard to dispute. They don't want to do anything about it. They want to complain about Border Patrol agents on horseback. Keep up with what's trending. Subscribe on YouTube and at Rumble.com. Streaming on Salem Now. The Democratic Party somehow has convinced black people that they're the good guys, never mind the skanky history of the Democratic Party. That was a party of slavery. He said, listen, I gotta give these niggas enough. Not too much, but enough that I'll have them voting Democrat for the next 200 years. The race grievance industry would have you believe that blacks get up and think about nothing else except race. If I tell you this is racist, yeah. I would get you emotional. There is a whole big uh, cottage industry for racism. If racism went away, a lot of people would be unemployed. The mob during the Minneapolis riots following the death of George Floyd. A bunch of white thugs, frankly, burning down the city's traditional black and Asian business district. They're racist, 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 racist. Everything's racist. It's the devil! Look for Salem Now in the App Store or go to SalemNow.com. Trending now on the Larry Elder Show. I saw the pictures. They were just grabbing them with their hands, and the reins are used to turn the horses. I was like, what? But this is what the left does. They fool people. If, if you're, okay, so I'm like, okay, okay. If, if I'm on that border, that border is being overwhelmed. I'm going a little crazy, okay? I'm going a little crazy. So maybe they got a little crazy, but maybe, you know what I mean? If we were in that situation, but no, come to find out, it was just another left-wing attack, another left-wing fiasco made to look like you heard Ilhan Omar saying that our country is systemically racist. Meanwhile, her black behind is on TV. Her black behind is in Congress shaping our nation and to an anti-Semitic country, but we're systemically racist. Meanwhile, this bigot is in Congress shaping our nation and turning our nation into a bunch of racists. I kid you not, I feel like every day I come into this studio, I feel like I'm, I'm, I'm checking the corner. Where's Ashton Kutcher? Because I feel like I'm being punked by the Democrats every day. Out there. Uh, let's go to Joel in San Diego, California. Yeah, man, 1996. Everyone forgets 900 FBI files were found in the Clinton White House. Hmm, good and, point. And they've been in the pocket of the FBI for years. Joel, so this thing wow. goes deep. We need a new uh, untouchables 
to be huh. reincarnated. Keep up with what's trending. Subscribe on YouTube and at rumble.com. Trending now on America First with Sebastian Gorka. I feel dumb asking this question. Is there any way to vet 120,000 Afghan quote-unquote refugees if they don't have any ID papers, Tom? No. And let me tell you something. Let's just look at the facts. It takes, a special immigrant visa, it takes 18 to 24 months to vet. Yeah. Right? Because the CIS gets it, they send it to the chief of mission at the embassy. He has it for, you know at least 12, 13 months, and they go through all the Afghan records, right? right. They, they, it's a birth certificate legitimate. Is a passport legitimate. they got to go through all these certain documents and, and check numerous databases, including DOD databases. Is, is there any derogatory information on this person? Before, the, before this happened in Afghanistan, the regular process took 18 and 24 months. And here's the fact. 84%, 84% of SI visa requests were denied. Wow. And that's when they had time to actually vet them. So now they're trying to vet within days or weeks when they got no access. There is no chief of mission. There is no embassy over there. I don't know where the operator is. Do they have access to Afghan records anymore? Does the Taliban have it? How do they know what's a legitimate passport? Where do all the records for the Afghan government go? So we got no staff over there, no insight over there. We don't have access to Afghan paperwork. And I talked to people here at Dulles, law enforcement, that said these, some of these people are showing is absolutely zero ID. How the hell can you possibly vet them? If you got an 84% denial rate, when they have time, that tells you how, how, how full of fraud this whole system so, so is. So the idea that we are, we, we, we are still safe, that this isn't being exploited by terrorists, that's just garbage, right, Tom? We, we, are, we are scary unsafe. Keep up with what's trending. Subscribe today at rumble.com. Those powerful organs of the state are not merely corrupt, but that they've been weaponized. We are now all rooting for his success. That's not what happened. It was a complete ambush. I thought it's early enough. Let's just send a couple guys over. And the audience was, ha, 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 ha. How funny to set up an innocent man. It divided the country in ways that people can't imagine. It's inspired massive violence. Look for Salem Now in the App Store or go to salemnow.com. Trending Now on The Charlie Kirk Show. The New York, the front page of the New York Times, the alleged paper of record. All the news that's fit to print, Pravda says. Front page of the New York Times says, Manhattan is buoyed as Google buys a building for $2.1 billion. New York Times also says, Trump campaign new vote case was groundless. This is what the New York Times is covering today. The paper of record. They're also covering Biden's speech at the United Nations, which we will cover a little bit. There's not that much there to cover, as he read from a teleprompter. Instead, we're going to cover the imminent invasion happening in our country. We already have had 1.8 million people illegally cross into our country this year. 1.8 million. Cutting in line border jumping, breaking the law. These are criminals, and they should be treated as criminals. This is designed disorder by the Biden regime. And only thanks to Fox News stumbling across this and publicizing it do we even know this is happening. And in some of the coverage on Tucker Carlson's wonderful show, there was something that was said by Bill Magulin that I think was quite revealing, something that I think exposed how this could actually be solved, that many people are upset that the southern border is wide open, but we feel powerless. We feel helpless. In fact, we are told that unless the Biden regime steps up and does something, there is nothing we can do. Keep up with what's trending. Subscribe on YouTube today.
Morning, Glory America. Bonjour. Hi, Canada. I'm Hugh Hewitt. I'm not there today. I'm down south. I'm in the deep south today, but for one day. Luckily, we have the one and only Mark Davis up from Dallas, the estimable Mark Davis, to fill in for me. Talk to you about the Cowboys, recognize Ohio State football preeminence, do all the things we do on Friday and have a good time. You're in a pro's, pro's hands. Take it away, Mark. Thank you, Hugh. Appreciate it very much. And a pleasant good morning, a good Friday morning, and a happy October here from uh, big, thriving Dallas-Fort Worth, where I'm the happy morning host at 660 AM, The Answer in DFW, where doing the Hugh Hewitt Show is like show prep for my local program. Be downstairs in just a minute, kids, and do the show that we enjoy together here in uh, the big DFW. But to be here on the Hugh Hewitt Show, any morning is a blessing. One hour down, one to go. The Hillsdale hour will be next hour. And so I'll see you back here whenever whenever they ask. And Hugh himself will be back on Monday. Phone number is 1-800-520-1234. At the bottom of this hour, we're going to welcome a Washington Times columnist who weighs in on the notion of looking backward versus looking forward. Uh, the degree to which we want to engage in some hand-wringing and some forensics about what happened to us in 2020 versus the energy that we expend moving forward in, with with elections that we can still do something about in 2022 and 2024. And at a slightly jostled time, which is great because maybe a lot of people will hear him uh, who have ordinarily not, a uh, poet laureate of the Hugh Hewitt Show, Tarzana Joe, will join us in the final segment today. And who knows what kind of rhymes he may bust when he joins us. All right, uh, let me uh, let me share uh, the, the man of the hour, Joe Manchin, just a little bit of audio and video from him. And then we're going right to your calls, 1-800-520-1234. In our first hour, we talked a little bit about who's pulling the strings, what's going on. This is a presidential nightmare. How do we get out of this? What's even happening? Are people noticing objectively how bad things are, or is it just a conservative? echo chamber, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. 1-800-520-1234. Uh, this is going to be cut 14. Joe Manchin in a press scrum. The interesting thing about West Virginia Senator Joe Manchin is, is he for real? He, he is less of a bug-eyed socialist extremist than a lot of the Senate Democrats, than a lot of elected Democrats at many levels. But can will he stay true to his moderation enough to really be a thorn in the side of this radical agenda. Take a look at this as Joe Manchin weighed in on the $3.5 trillion price tag. At this, at that point in time, I was not in favor of moving on this type of a piece of legislation. I wasn't trying to be the fly in the ointment at all. I've never been. I've never been a liberal in any way, shape, or the form. There's no one has ever thought I was. I've been governor, I've been state secretary of state, I've been state legislature, I've been a U.S. senator, and I have voted pretty consistently all my whole life. I don't fault any of them who believe that they're much more progressive and much more liberal. God bless them. And all they need to do is we have to elect more, I guess, for them to get theirs, elect more liberals. But don't. I'm not asking them to change. I'm willing to come from zero to one five. Every, everything's relative. He's willing to come from zero to 1.5. He's asking others who are more liberal among his ranks to come from 3.5 down to 1.5. Joe Manchin saying, I've never been a liberal. Well, it's didn't we always say, haven't, haven't many people said of, you know, McCain and Romney and, you know, and a lot of people, well, they're not, they're not really conservative. Well, not, they're not as conservative as Ted Cruz. Joe Manchin is not as liberal as Chuck Schumer. But it is check the enormous voting difference between him and almost any other Democrat. It's not that different. And that leads, I think, to a lot of cynicism as people say, ultimately, Joe Manchin and Kirsten Cinema of Arizona, that they will ultimately do what the party wants them to do. And as we get ready to take some of your calls here, 1-800-520-1234, ultimately, Democrats are going to Democrat to make it both a noun and a verb. And by that, I mean they're going to realize that this delicious moment of one-party rule that they have is not going to last long, that uh, we're going to win the House, conservative, Republican, well, Freudian slip, please let them be conservatives. Republicans winning is great. Having people with an R by their name is better than having people with a D by their name. But they've got to be the right kind of Republicans. Not every state is going to deliver die-hard, died-in-the-wool 
Republicans. Glenn Youngkin, I believe, is going to be the next governor of Virginia. Is he as as conservative as Ron DeSantis? No. But on any day of the week, is he a much better governor than Terry McAuliffe would be? Obviously. So take what you can get. And in the old Bill Buckley adage, vote for the, 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 the most conservative person you can who can win. And so we're fighting hard and fighting smart, moving into 2022 and 24. Having played Joe Manchin, let's stay in West Virginia. And Jay, that is you. Welcome. Mark Davis filling in for Hugh. Happy Friday. How are you? Good. Uh, quick comment on Joe Manchin. Uh, as governor, we're a balanced budget state, so you have to keep that in, in, in your background there. He's always been a balanced budget guy, but he'll agree to do something. He'll, he'll go to 1.5. He'll agree to do something on that. Mm-hmm. Uh, as to Youngkin in Virginia, I'm concerned that all those Democrat loyalists in the state, they're going to stay with McAuliffe. It'll be interesting from a referendum standpoint to see if they'll break away or not. Uh, here's my question for you. Um, I have friends that are Democrat Party loyals, loyalists. They don't think Biden can do anything wrong. Uh, it's just the philosophy they have. How do you argue with those people and discuss it with them? Because they still, they're still in his camp. There are millions of people like this. They don't see that he's doing anything wrong. How do you discuss this with them? Okay. There are two kinds of Biden voters. I mean, there are 12 kinds, but there, there are two broadly defined. One are the dyed-in-the-wool liberals who believe everything that he's doing is great, They love him. They might love AOC. They love Pelosi. They love Schumer. They miss Obama. And they believe in big government and soft borders and pro-choice and everything you and I disagree with. Those are dyed-in-the-wool liberals. They will not be converted. Now, if they're in your life as friends and family members, you can either A, engage constructively, you know, have a coffee or a beer and just have a good old time with it. That requires a lot of grace and a lot of latitude or just agree not to talk about stuff like this, but there will be no converting them. The other group, and herein lies our our hope, are folks who may not be as ideologically wired as as you and I are or as those died in the wool liberals are. They, they happen to vote for Biden. They might have voted for Hillary Obama, first black president, yay, but they weren't really thinking a whole lot about it. And, for, and some of these were Trump voters, and by this I mean the people who might not be that conservative, might not be that Republican, but they take a look at a candidate and go, eh. <laughs> one might say, what have I got to lose? And so when people look at inflation, which they will all recognize, the video of, a, of an open border, which anybody can recognize, when they take a look at a number, the, the Afghan exit, which was a disaster by anybody's measure, and when those centrists, independents, folks in the mushy middle, when they take a look at the Democrat track record, and, and if they find it wanting, th- those are people whom we can mine, whom we can pluck, whom we can poach, whom we can lovingly uh, uh, coax into our camp. And that's how we win. Okay. Well, okay. That, that gives me some thoughts. All right, well, I appreciate it. It's my goal. I love giving people thoughts and getting them in return at 1-800-520-1234. Let's head to Columbus, Ohio. Jr. hey. Mark Davis in for Hugh. How are you doing? Good Friday to you. Hey, good morning, Mark. Go Bucks, go Browns. Um, the, uh, uh, the reason I called is I not only do not want Biden to be impeached, but I don't think that's healthy for a country on any level unless it's something absolutely extreme. Yeah. But I don't think he's going to finish out his term. I think what's going to happen, this is my opinion, obviously, mm-hmm. is He's going to physically either acting or for real come on one day and say, as, as, a, as a good deed to my country, I am passing the reins on to my vice president, Kamala mm. Harris, mm. and guess what? Nothing will change. Well, and some would argue it might get worse. Uh, I don't know. It's like we're writing a bad Tom Clancy novel at this point. Uh, the, the notion of Biden and what, what will happen? Will he simply be pressured by people into resigning or will he just look in the mirror and have a moment of introspection and say, this is not good for the country. I must step aside, step into the strike zone, take one for the team. Biden is not going to resign. Come on. Okay. 
Yeah. No, you know what? I, <laughs> you're I, way I'm too easy. I'm actually glad you said that because <laughs> I, was, I convinced myself. No, that was well, well, let me uh, let me disabuse you of that notion. That's cool. Well, I wish all calls went that way. Somebody says something, I say something back, and they go, "Well, all right." <laughs> oh, okay. One eight hundred five two zero one two three four. Look, we've got what about a minute or so? So rather than give a caller short shrift, let me uh, get to the break. Come back. We'll take a couple more here. A couple of other golden pieces of audio and video that have been uh, cultivated for the program. Lots going on, and, and it's when things are this bad. It's we do write movie scripts in our head. What if he resigns? What if impeachment works? Twenty fifth Amendment. The greatest likelihood is we're all going to wheeze through this presidency together, and then just simply do much better for ourselves. Let's focus. Focus on that. Mark Davison for Hugh Hewitt. Happy Friday. Portions of the Hugh Hewitt Show are brought to you by Alliance Defending Freedom. The most powerful organs of the state are not merely corrupt but that they've been weaponized. We are now all rooting for his success. That's not what happened. It was a complete ambush. I thought it's early enough. Let's just send a couple guys over. And the audience was, ha, 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 ha. How funny to set up an innocent man. It divided the country in ways that people can't imagine. It's inspired massive violence. Look for Salem Now in the App Store or go to SalemNow.com. Trending now on The Charlie Kirk Show. The New York, the front page of the New York Times, the alleged paper of record, all the news that's fit to print, Pravda says. Front page of the New York Times says, Manhattan is buoyed as Google buys a building for $2.1 billion. New York Times also says, Trump campaign new vote case was groundless. This is what... The New York Times is covering today. The paper of record. They're also covering Biden's speech at the United Nations, which we will cover a little bit. There's not that much there to cover, as he read from a teleprompter. Instead, we're going to cover the imminent invasion happening in our country. We already have had 1.8 million people illegally cross into our country this year. 1.8 million. Cutting in line, border jumping, breaking the law. These are criminals, and they should be treated as criminals. This is designed disorder by the Biden regime. And only thanks to Fox News stumbling across this and publicizing it do we even know this is happening. And in some of the coverage on Tucker Carlson's wonderful show, there was something that was said by Bill Magulin that I think was quite revealing. Something that I think exposed how this could actually be solved. That many people are upset that the southern border is wide open, but we feel powerless. We feel helpless. In fact, we are told that unless the Biden regime steps up and does something, there is nothing we can do. Keep up with what's trending. Subscribe on YouTube today. Trending now on the Dennis Prager Show. We've ended 20 years of conflict in Afghanistan. And as we close this period of relentless war, we're opening a new era of relentless diplomacy, of using the power of our development aid to invest in new ways of lifting people up around the world. Mm -hmm. I love that. We've ended 20 years of conflict in Afghanistan. That's not true. We've ended 20 years of American troops in Afghanistan. We have not ended 20 years of conflict in Afghanistan. I wish, I wish we did. The Taliban has taken over. That, that is exactly, that, that would be like saying if uh, Churchill had uh, decided not to fight Hitler any longer, well, We've ended uh, all these years of conflict uh, with Germany. Except when you have tyrants in charge, violent tyrants, you have not ended conflict. You have only ended your role in it. It shows 
the the statement is fascinating. It's so incorrect that it really demands explanation. Why would somebody say something so incorrect? We have not ended 20 years of conflict. We have ended 20 years of American engagement, or at least direct engagement. And that is because basically most people, and I even include a lot of conservatives, really don't give a damn about Afghans. Something I've never quite understood. I am forthright about this. I think America should be the world's policeman. Keep up with what's trending. Subscribe on YouTube today. Pretty good 61-year-old record, wouldn't you say, from 1960, The Twist? Pretty good 61-year-old record from a pretty legendary 80-year-old man. Chubby Checker turns 80 on Sunday, so we reach into the weekend, pluck out the uh, the Chubby Checker birthday. Uh, an iconic record written, actually, and charting a couple of years early by Han- earlier by Hank Ballard. All right, um, so there's this idea working its way through the house. That if Roe v. Wade is not long for this world, and it's not, uh, that maybe it needs to be codified, needs to be put into law, that the law of the land simply needs to establish a federal right to abortion. And when you get Democrats all hopped up uh, about that, uh, you get golden moments like this. Let's go to Congresswoman Jackie Speer, House Oversight hearing on the notion of the bill codifying Roe in a country that is decidedly more pro-life than it was when Roe was so improperly uh, decided in 1973, Congresswoman Jackie Spear, cut three. So according to a, a 2018 report by the National Academies of Sciences, Engineering, and Medicine, abortion is safer than childbirth, colonoscopies, dental procedures, plastic surgery, and tonsillectomies. And yet, facilities that provide abortion care are more likely to be subjected to medically unnecessary politically motivated regulations that only make it more difficult to provide abortion services. Huh. You know, so Congresswoman Spears' checked, point, go ahead. Yes, yes. Uh, the fatality rate in an abortion is at about 50% every time. Yeah, she talks about how it's safer, that abortion is safer than childbirth. For whom? For whom? All right, let's 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 do the the double shot here. Let's roll to the always always uh, intriguing Gloria Steinem, who was roped into this thing. And um, uh, once again, the the whole notion here is is the demonization of those of us who are trying to protect the unborn. Vintage Gloria Steinem, she still got it. Cut old forward. enough to remember how bad it was uh, when abortion was illegal. That's why what's happening in Texas is not only a local issue or a women's issue, it's a step against democracy, which allows us to control our own bodies and our own voices. Remember when Hitler was elected, and he was elected, his very first official act was to padlock the family planning clinics and declare abortion a crime against well, the Well, there state. you are. Okay, Gloria, thank you. Invoke, are we all familiar with Godwin's law? Godwin's yes. law is, is it essentially Hitler, says at the, some the, point... the notorious pro-lifer. <laughs> someone, exactly right. <laughs> someone at some point will invoke Hitler in order to just uh, propel whatever point they're trying to make. All right, let's see what kind of points people are trying to make on the phones. We are in Portland, Oregon. Kim, hey, Mark Davis in for Hugh. Welcome and happy Friday. Thank you, sir. I've been on the phone so long, I don't think this is going to come out, right? That's okay. But, you're, you're gonna Pick any topic you like. You've been patient. I appreciate okay. it. Well, I see that it's very odd that the whole world is being turned upside down at the same time. So there's obviously a plan. And I majored in journalism. I don't see any journalism in effect now. It is very slanted um, and torqued and mm-hmm. uh, just misinformation or not mentioning it. Also, um, the social media, I think these rich, 
powerful people are trying to become governments by controlling and slowly eroding our rights, our freedom of speech. And can you please tell me, is Jill Biden not complicit? Is she not a doctor? Or is it she's a dentist or a doctor of philosophy? How, how, is, the, how is the, we were on a roll there, how is the first lady complicit in what? In that something's going on. Jill Biden is a doctor. She's referred to as a doctor. Yes. And so she's complicit just as well, are I mean, many, many people. Politicians. Well, she, <laughs> I guess, it, well, I, I, on my list of people I blame, on my list of people I hold accountable, it takes me a while before I get to Jill. But uh, is she on board for her husband's agenda and to be judged accordingly? Sure, let's go with that. Uh, one of the interesting things said was about journalism. I, too, have a journalism degree on my wall, University of Maryland, 1979. And even in that liberal state, I don't think they foresaw what we have now, which is open, bald-faced, craven advocacy masquerading as journalism. Mark Davis in for Hugh Hewitt, Friday show in progress. Glad you're here. Portions of the Hugh Hewitt Show are brought to you in part by Job Creators Network. are not merely corrupt, but that they've been weaponized to go after perceived domestic enemies. And that's very scary. Our constitutional democracy enshrines the peaceful transfer of power. We are now all rooting for a success. The peaceful transition of power is one of the hallmarks of our democracy. We don't live in the United States of America as is any of us would like to understand it. We have a peaceful transition of power process. That's not what happened. They interviewed General Flynn, and they did it in what was a complete ambush. I thought it's early enough. Let's just send a couple guys over. And the audience was, ha, 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 ha. How funny to set up an innocent man. This is what third world security states do. They spy on their political opponents like this. This is part of a concerted uh, Russian influence operation. Russian interference. They colluded. They were in on it. He would constantly say, I have seen evidence of collusion. Until this is released, I can't comment. I can't go into the particulars. Russians, I'm not going to be specific. As he knew he could just say it on TV and then hide behind. Well, it's all classified. I can't get into it. Well, it's classified. You can't see it. Collusion. You just got to be willing to see it. New York's Daily News ran this front page, Trump is Hitler. How could 62 million Americans vote for Hitler? Are 62 million Americans Nazis? We really almost thought it was a joke. Like, really, you're not going to accept that you lost this election? Then they see the Russia collusion narrative sitting right there in front of them and say, why don't we just say that he cheated? It divided the country in ways that people can't imagine. It's inspired massive violence. It's given people who are bad faith actors a license to do whatever they want because they literally feel like they're fighting Russian spies and Nazis. Russiagate has been the most egregious abuse of everything that was supposed to have been good about our government. The thing that they were investigating the Trump campaign for is what they themselves were doing. Streaming on Salem Now. Salem Now in the App Store or go to SalemNow.com. 
which is even worse than being poor. Uh, we would have sandwiches with no meat. My American dream entailed working hard and making $20,000 a year. But I surpassed that goal and became a corporate CEO. We'll all be able to say, free at last, free at last. Look for Salem Now in the App Store or go to Salem Now. Streaming on Salem Now. The public would be outraged if they knew the truth. Why do you think our politicians are not on the sidewalk right now talking to you? No, I have no respect. The old wall randomly turns into a guardrail, followed by miles of open border. Human trafficking bar. That journey is extremely dangerous. The seven-year-old girl died in the desert. From the country of India. A great pillar of the community was killed by a man who had been deported at least twice. This little urn contains the ashes of my son. His dreams cut short forever. We're so worried about other countries' problems, and we don't even focus on our own. Look for Salem Now in the App Store, or go to Salem Now on Salem Now. Tesla was a genius. His most amazing discoveries thought to be written in a lost journal. Now in the right hands, it could revolutionize the 21st century. You can stop an earthquake. Doesn't that mean you could start one too? That, that's why that notebook should never fall into the wrong hands. Shall we stop this thing? Save, Save the universe! universe. Look for Salem Now in the App Store or go to SalemNow.com. This family can pick you up every time you fall. Every time I take one step forward. Well, Wright came in this morning. He wants to fight you. No one expected this out of him. Look for Salem Now in the App Store or go to SalemNow.com. So we wanted to throw some love to Lindsey Buckingham. A couple of reasons. He turned 72 on Sunday, and I just think he needs the love. Lindsey Buckingham there with the lead vocal on Blue Letter. This is from the Fleetwood Mac album 1975, when he and and, uh, and Stevie Nicks joined the already existing, already uh, uh, accomplished band and turned them into just pop sensations. Lindsey Buckingham, he got kicked out of Fleetwood Mac, and you got Neil Finn doing the vocals, and Mike Campbell of Tom Petty and the Heartbreakers doing the guitar. They just uh, they just had like their most their biggest grossing tour ever. While Lindsey Buckingham may well be eating dog food by this time, I'm not sure. It's not going well for him. So let's just uh, wish him a good birthday here at 72. So when I fill in for Hugh Hewitt, let me pull the curtain back and tell you a little bit of how I do this. I got my front loaded with 14 things I want to talk about, but then I go looking for columns and pieces and blogs and newspapers and, and things that just raise an eyebrow and seem like, hmm, this is something I've been thinking about. This is something I've been talking about on the show that I host here in DFW and the various uh, outposts on the, the national scene when I get to fill in. And I found a Michael McKenna column in the Washington Times, and the headline is, Time for Trump and the GOP to get over the 2020 election. Well, okay, what does that look like? Michael McKenna is here. Pleasure to meet you, sir. How are you doing? I'm good. How about yourself? Fantastic. Thanks for being here. So when I saw the column and read it, I processed it in the following way, and I'll, I'll give you 30 seconds on this and then just hand you the uh, the talking stick back and, and see what your thought is. People always ask me, hey, Mark, uh, what do you think about those all those audits? We need more forensic audits. We need 47 forensic audits so we can know what happened in 2020. I am all about understanding how we got hosed in 2020. There were all kinds of votes that were accepted in various states that should not have been as rules and norms were just dashed against the rocks on phony COVID urgency. Now, that having been said, we ain't going to flip any states. We're not going to learn numerically that Trump won anything. I already know that we got hosed and every state is working on making our system better. Aren't we much better uh, served by focusing all this energy on getting good, solid laws to protect election integrity in 22, 24, picking good candidates and looking forward more than backward? 
Yeah, I find I find all of that very difficult to disagree with. Right? Um, you know, was were things not right? Absolutely. You know, were things changed because of COVID? Yes. Have they? Have those changes been addressed in most places? Yeah, they have been. Right? We kind of reeled it back in. Um, and we had almost a year now of this, the forensic stuff, the audits, the this, the that, and the other thing. Yeah. Is it going anywhere? No. And um, you know, I don't want to be that guy. No, but I know. <laughs> even, if, even if you woke up tomorrow morning and decided, hey, we think there was legitimate voter fraud in that state, um, there's no way for a state, there's no mechanism for a state to uncertify its election results. The, the current president is not leaving absent death, impeachment, or resignation, or the 2024 election. Those yeah. are your four options. <laughs> and I, I choose D out of that group. And, and, and you phrased it, I don't want to be that guy, as a wonderful sentiment, because all these people, they, they, they call, and I, I can hear the Christmas morning thrill, like at some point there's going to be some golden moment where we absolutely learn that Trump really did win Arizona or Pennsylvania, and it's simply not going to happen. But the, the, good, the good news, I try to wrap this in some good news, is that it is baked in that the 2020 election was was flawed. Its result was suspect, and that is not acceptable. So let's take that, go with it. States are doing things to improve. My state of Texas, chiefly among them, doing things to make sure as best we can in a human system that we don't get hosed again in 22 and 24. Will it be perfect? No. Will there be some type of fraud? Yes, there always will be. But I think we're on it, and I think we can start to focus on what we're far better served by, and that's putting up the kind of actual candidates where we can get the House back, maybe get the Senate back, and then get the White House back in 24. Does that make sense to you? Yeah, and it's hard to think about timing when you're living day to day, um, but the reality of it is we're 13 months away from an election cycle, right? Right now, yep. Um, yep. which means we're picking, which means we're picking primary, we're picking primary folks, we're raising money, we're talking about issues. And all that stuff that you kind of need to be doing now is um, getting impeded by the amount of mind share that's being spent on, hey, we got host, we got stolen, we got robbed. Yeah, I, I get all that, but it doesn't help you fix the problem, right? I, I think yeah. that is phrased beautifully. It, it let, let us stipulate, nope, no, let us stipulate that 2020 was a flawed election. Great, okay pin stuck in it. Got it. Let history bake that in. If anybody ever asks us about it, that's what we'll say. But now uh, I think that I'm I'm concerned that there's only so much, you know, energy in the tank and that we are getting distracted from what we absolutely listen. The primaries are just right around the bend because we can't just have Republicans win. They got to be the right kind of Republicans. So let me ask you how you think what the the kind of winning strategies are. It's, It's probably too glib to say that this Biden administration is so horribly horribly positioned that we're just going to walk to a wave election in 22. It's that kind of talk scares me. It might be true, but I don't even want to speak those words because I know there's no such thing as jinxes, but there is such a thing as overconfidence. What do you think? Yeah. yeah not only is there such a thing as overconfidence, everybody has it. Um, it, it um, when you look at the polling on the, on the current president's plan is 3.5 trillion plan to, um, mm-hmm. to change the whole world and make us make us socialists. Um, the most disturbing thing is parts of it are very popular, right? So you ask what needs to get done. If I could, you know, if we could just kind of turn some of that mind share and, and use it to educate people about this is actually um, toxic for a bunch of reasons, and here's why, right? We're not even doing that kind of basic thing. Uh, what I worry about is they pass legislation like this, Democrats go and say, hey, we've given you a bunch of free money. Who doesn't like free money? Um, you know, and we haven't laid any of the groundwork about what that actually means in the long term. So, uh, you know, this. so that you know, we're that's that's why the wasting of time now is so important, right? Because we're not using our time to educate voters properly on this stuff. That's that's beautifully put. Because we can sit here at the beginning of October and say the primaries are a half a year away, the full election is more than a year away. We got all the time in the world. No, we don't, because we're trying to tell a country. It, it, it died in the world. Democrats are, are never going to be peeled away from bo- voting for Biden or the Democrats of their choice. But we've got a big mushy middle in America that we've got to make a case cogently and effectively that the current ruling class just ain't getting it done. And please, please honor us by giving us a chance. 
So uh, Michael McKenna is here, Washington Times columnist. So in a column that talks about looking forward rather than backward, here's where I've clearly got to go, and I'm, I'm fa- everybody's answer differs. I'm interested in yours. Is part of looking forward uh, c- clinging to and embracing Trump-style energy, the Trumpian gift for hammering the left, but maybe finding it in another package. Maybe DeSantis, maybe Cotton, maybe Pompeo, but the 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 Trump 2.0, good idea or not so good idea? Yeah, um, okay. I, I, that, that's a particularly difficult one for me, right? I, I worked in the White House um, for the president. I, mm-hmm. I think very highly of him. Um, I am fully aware of all of his flaws. Um, I, I think the correct answer to that is right at the moment, sitting here in, in late 2021 is, not a decision we need to make for another 24 months, right? So I'm inclined to not make decisions unless I have to make decisions on this. Um, having said that, and I'm not going to try to weasel their answer. Thank you. Um, the president's already lost once, right? Um, yep. And it, unless unless you can make a convincing case that something's going to change, that there are going to be people who voted against him in 2020 who will vote for him in 2024, yeah, I think you probably need to to think about um, a different vehicle for the for the same basket of messages and and um, actions. Right. I deeply appreciate that answer because it, the reasons that I agree with you are really nothing but compliments for him. He he is so strong, so galvanizing that the, he energized two kinds of voters in 2020: conservative voters. And liberal voters, they moved heaven and earth. They crawled on broken glass to vote against him. And I don't want to give him the chance to do that again. Democrats feel like they've learned how to beat him once, and they might figure they've learned how to beat him twice. Where if we can get a DeSantis who seems to – well, oh, let me ask you. You you are a, 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 a presence in the Trump White House. Is DeSantis overpraised? Are we just so pleased, Lord, eager to find somebody that has a, a kind of a Trumpian mantle? What's your assessment of DeSantis? Yeah, voters are a lot like 16-year-old boys. Um, as a mass, right? They 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 fixate on one pretty girl after another. Um, it's it's always hard to figure out when the wheel's going to stop. So I, I get that the flavor of the month is DeSantis, and and rightfully so, right? I mean, mm-hmm. He's a very impressive guy. So is Governor Abbott from Texas, right? Um, there's so is Mike Pompeo, right? There's, mm-hmm. there's four or five people who I think could be president tomorrow morning and do a quite good job. Um, and I and I think that's. The other part of this question, right? Do you have somebody who could do a good job? And the answer to that is yes. We have we have three or four people you could ha- you could put in the Oval Office tomorrow morning, and they'd have a pretty good understanding of what needed to be done. So when we is take a look at no, it, it's a very good answer, in fact, uh, because none of these are are, are three word propositions. You got to see what where, where there's so much that the future will yield. What makes sense right now may not make sense six months from now, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Um, if Trump does run, is it everybody else's responsibility just to bug out and let the inevitable happen? Or are we, this may be another reason why God bless you, sir. I love you. I love you. Probably not a good idea for your run is from Pompeo to cotton to, uh, to Nikki Haley to who knows who he, he would just have to bludgeon all of them. He would just have to steamroll all of them because that's what he does in primaries. We've seen it. We've seen this movie. Yeah, and that's the risk, right? There, as we sit here right now, there's probably limited doubt that he he'd win in a in a Republican primary in 2024, mm-hmm. and that's a bit of a that's a bit of a pickle, right? But the, the other thing is the, the 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 massiveness of that potential win kind of shrinks as time yeah. goes on, which makes you think there's a there may be an expiration date on this. I th- I think that's beautifully put. What an opportune uh, thing. I got to tell you, not to break my arm, pat myself on the back, but I'm glad I found your column and you're a wonderful guest. And Michael McKenna, a wonderful writer. Check him out in the Washington Times. Pleasure to meet you, sir. Thank you for being here. Speaking of people who craft a, a, a skillful word or two, Tarzana Joe and his poem of the week when we come back. Don't go anywhere. Mark Davis will be right back. I do want to remind you about the Job Creators Network bus tour underway now. I will be in Atlanta, Hugh Hewitt will be in Atlanta, on October the 13th. And you can go get your tickets to join me and Alfredo Ortiz, the president of Job Creators Network, and Herschel at am920theanswer.com. That's am920theanswer.com. We will be at the Atlanta History Center, along with Brian Westbury and Herschel. So what? you can't beat that. But in the meantime, if you don't live in Atlanta and you can't come out on October 13th and you can't go get a ticket at am920theanswer.com, you can find out where Alfredo and the Job Creators Network bus tour is 
by going to jcnbustour.com. Pretty smart, huh? jcnbustour.com. Job Coded Network, bustour.com. Let me also remind you about relieffactor.com. I'm not taking it this hour. I usually already taken it by the time I leave the door. But when I'm gone, I want to remind you, don't make any mistakes while I'm away. Make sure you take your Relief Factor every day. I was with the founder of Relief Factor two days ago before I left D.C., and I complimented him on the design of his product. The wonderful, easy-to-open pack, the four pills that are easy to swallow, the more amazing design features of the larger bag in which they come, how easy it is to open, how easy it is to use. Most importantly, though, I thanked him because I use it every day, and tens of thousands of you do the very same thing. And more join every single month because they want to be free of the aches and pains of growing a little bit older or of doing more exercise. Whether you're young and out there running wind sprints and up and down stadium steps or you're older and you're just trying to get your 10,000 steps in, ReliefFactor.com is for you. $19.95 gets you started. Give it a try. And then come right back for more of Mark Davis. Portions of the Hugh Hewitt Show are brought to you by Alliance Defending Freedom. Streaming on Salem Now. The most powerful organs of the state are not merely corrupt, but that they've been weaponized. We are now all rooting for his success. That's not what happened. It was a complete ambush. I thought it's early enough. Let's just send a couple guys over. And the audience was, ha, 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 ha. How funny to set up an innocent man. This is what third world security states do. They spy on their political opponents like this. This is part of a concerted uh, Russian influence operation. Russians, I'm not going to be specific as He knew he could just say it on TV and then hide behind, well, it's all classified, I can't get into it. It divided the country in ways that people can't imagine. It's inspired massive violence. It's given people who are bad faith actors a license to do whatever they want. Look for Salem Now in the App Store or go to SalemNow.com. Streaming on Salem Now. The most powerful organs of the state are not merely corrupt, but that they've been weaponized. We are now all rooting for his success. That's not what happened. It was a complete ambush. I thought it's early enough. Let's just send a couple guys over. <laughs> and the audience was, ha, 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 ha. How funny to set up an innocent man. This is what third world security states do. They spy on their political opponents like this. This is part of a concerted uh, Russian influence operation. Russians, I'm not going to be specific as He knew he could just say it on TV and then hide behind, well, it's all classified, I can't get into it. It divided the country in ways that people can't imagine. It's inspired massive violence. It's given people who are bad faith actors a license to do whatever they want. Look for Salem Now in the App Store or go to SalemNow.com. Streaming on Salem Now. The most powerful organs of the state are not merely corrupt, but that they've been weaponized. We are now all rooting for his success. That's not what happened. It was a complete ambush. I thought it's early enough. Let's just send a couple guys over. <laughs> and the audience was, ha, 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 ha. How funny to set up an innocent man. This is what third world security states do. They spy on their political opponents like this. This is part of a concerted uh, Russian influence operation. Russians, I'm not going to be specific as He knew he could just say it on TV and then hide behind, well, it's all classified, I can't get into it. It divided the country in ways that people can't imagine. It's inspired massive violence. It's given people who are bad faith actors a license to do whatever they want. Look for Salem Now in the App Store or go to SalemNow.com. Streaming on Salem Now. The most powerful organs of the state are not merely corrupt, but that they've been weaponized. We are now all rooting for his success. That's not what happened. It was a complete ambush. I thought it's early enough. Let's just send a couple guys over. <laughs> and the audience was, ha, 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 ha. How funny to set up an innocent man. This is what third world security... I can pick you up every time you fall. Every time I take one step forward. When Wright came in this morning, he wants to fight you. No one expected this out of him. Look for Salem Now in the App Store or go to SalemNow.com. I think this family can pick you up every time you
I believe Hugh invoked the great Cat Stevens not too many shows ago. Cat Stevens, Teaser, and the Fire Cat. Loved those album titles of his back in the 70s. Bitter Blue, this also had Peace Train and Morning Has Broken. Cat Stevens, Teaser, and the Fire Cat, released 50 years ago today. So there's a little chart history for you. And so my usual Friday routine is getting ready for my own uh, proud, happy local show here on 660 AM, The Answer in Dallas-Fort Worth, and driving around and listening to Hugh Hewitt on the way in. And on Fridays, that means I get to hear him bandy a few things back and forth with Tarzana Joe. Well, look at my good fortune. Joe is here now, and I get to hear today's poem delivered to me as if in a personal audience, and I couldn't be more privileged. Joe, welcome back. How are you doing, sir? Fine. You're always so kind and gracious when we have the opportunity to do Well, I, I, mean, so I mean every word. Words mean things, and there's no better uh, champion of that than you. So what do we have in store today? You might not feel that way after this poem. <laughs> okay. but let's, let's I will withhold, I'll withhold further comment. Let's, let, we'll we review go. afterward. All right. I make no claim to higher calling. If I'm not fallen, well, I'm falling. But here's a fact, and you all know it's prophets way back when were poets. Old Moses said we all should be one. You know a prophet when you see one. And with so much that needs decrying, I feel the need for prophesying. Here's a point those prophets stress. No country it was like this one blessed. For with great faith our leaders led. Important, as de Tocqueville said. Now leaders claim to be devout while throwing all the doctrine out. And willingly so many followed. Eagerly their nonsense swallowed. Abandon each, abandoning each holy book, those leaders let us off the hook. So given all our good and treasure, we gave up grace and turned to pleasure. Then suddenly the pleasure stopped, and out from us the bottom dropped. In times like these, I find it odd that few have said, let's turn to God. Instead, as this pandemic lurches, they lock the doors and close the churches, and we as this drags year to year, have locked ourselves inside our fear. Now I can say without a doubt, from this there's only one way out. Reflect, and when your grief is grieved, return to what you once believed. For in the very darkest hour, trust there is a higher power. And let that trust renew your heart. It's not a lot, but it's a start. That's Profit and Loss by Tarzana Joe. If uh, that was supposed to leave me lukewarm or conflicted, um, wrong call. Okay. Uh, that ta- <laughs> talk about talk about something that is urgently needed. Now it is, and, and what a, what a key word this is. It's divisive, Joe. It's divisive. It will cause people to react in different ways, and Lord knows we can't have that. Yes, but well, my so reaction. Is so is a can opener. Exactly right. Electric or manual, it does get the job done, as do you. TarzanaJoe.com, at TarzanaJoe on Twitter. That was just superb. Listen, all your work is is either particularly wry, particularly topical. That, uh, that That's a keeper for the ages, and I'm glad I was here uh, to, to hear it. Thank you, sir. Appreciate Once it. again, kind and gracious. Thank you. I so appreciate it. The great Tarzana Joe. Wow. Golly. Whew, and find all of his stuff as some of his past stuff. He wrote one called the 2021 Project. Uh, maybe it was last week. So uh, there at uh, TarzanaJoe.com. All right. Uh, we're just about done. And I want to put something in your ear before I fold up the tent and hand it over to the third hour of Hugh, which is the Hillsdale conversation. So you and I slinging hot topics is done for the day. But let me share this. Speaking of hot topic, did you hear Hugh playing the Terry McAuliffe uh, cut? The other day about we're not going to let parents tell schools what to teach. That's <laughs> sweet. And listen, that may lose an election for Terry McAuliffe, which is a good thing. But the battle goes on. The battle really never stops. And as we take a look at, at, at Terry McAuliffe, who said that he was proud to have vetoed legislation that would have alerted parents when you know some type of porn winds up in the instructional materials. You got to understand that the battle in the school boards that we see extends to the battle in Congress. All of our cherished freedoms are under fire, parental rights and others. And that's why it's so urgent that you join me, which is to join Hugh in supporting our friends at Alliance Defending Freedom. Go to HughHewitt.com, click on the Alliance Defending Freedom banner. Are your rights as a parent worth $100 to defend? Because that's what I'm asking you for. And whenever I fill in for you or anybody else, I always like the actual host to come back and go, whoa, what happened there? Because that means you listen to me 
and and said, let's give Hugh a big surprise. And it's not about surprising Hugh or or even making the folks at ADF happy. It is about fighting the fights that we need to fight, and they do that for us every day in court battles where their track record is amazing. So let me hit you up for 100 bucks to the Freedom Fund at HughHewitt.com and click on the ADF banner. Can you do that for me today? I so appreciate it. Hugh appreciates it. ADF appreciates it. And we will all, those of us who love liberty, will all appreciate it because now more than ever, you need Alliance Defending Freedom to be ready to help you or your college-age student or your church because the Constitution is not suspended during a pandemic. But we've seen case over after case after case where governments try to impose their will on average citizens. ADF is the backstop against that. Go to HughHewitt.com, click the ADF banner, and give what you can. Thank you, thank you, thank you. Thank you, Dwayne. Thank you, Adam. Thank you, Hugh Hewitt listeners. I'm Mark Davis. i got a local show to go do, so let me go do that. And uh, follow me on Twitter, at Mark Davis, and I'll be back next time they ask me right here on the Hugh Hewitt Show. Have a fantastic weekend. Charlie Kirk Show. Morning, glory, America. Bonjour. Hi, Canada. Hugh Hewitt inside the Beltway, and I'm holding up a. We now have what would only possibly be explained as a refugee camp somewhere out of Syria or Somalia in our own country in Del Rio, Texas. Now, Del Rio, Texas is right across the border from Mexico. Mexico has no desire or interest to actually secure the southern border on their side, unlike under President Trump, who actually negotiated a deal and threatened tariffs. And as soon as President Trump threatened a 5% tariff, Mexico came straight to the table and they started to try to secure the southern border. Now, we have manufactured mayhem right now in Del Rio, Texas, and the only reason we know anything about it is thanks to Fox News and one drone that flew. Keep up with what's trending. Subscribe on YouTube today. Trending now on The Dennis Prager Show. We meet the threat of challenging climate, the challenging climate we're all feeling, already ravaging every part of our world with extreme weather. Or will we suffer the merciless march of ever worsening droughts and floods, more intense fires and hurricanes, longer heat waves and rising seas? It's, uh, it, it's something that I broadcast regularly. Bjorn Lomberg and others who actually report on the science that a lot of what he just said isn't true, but it doesn't matter because the left believes it, the left owns the media, and so people believe it. Keep up with what's trending. Subscribe on YouTube today. Trending now on America First with Sebastian Gorka. Overweight snowflake. What has race got to do with the last election and angry voters? Nothing. But you want to virtue signal to your political masters. If it's possible, let's ignore for a second that you have admitted you called the Chinese equivalent of the chairman of the Joint Chiefs, that you haven't denied that you gave him a heads up totally illegally because you have no role in the chain of command and say, don't, don't worry. If, if that crazy guy, the president, if President Trump is going to declare war with China, I'll, I'll give you a heads up. I'm on your side, you commies. I'm a commie too. Is that why in 2015 in combat at a NATO summit, you can see the video right there. He says, China, 
not our enemy. Really? Because China thinks America is her enemy? Why would you say that? And why do you think it's your duty to be communist China's man inside the Pentagon? Let's put that all to one side. Your love of bigoted propaganda like critical race theory created by Derek Hall, Biden's mentor at Harvard, which states, the textbook state, if you are white, you are racist. You may not know it, but you're racist, which itself is a statement of bigotry. Keep up with what's trending. Subscribe today at rumble.com. Trending now on The Charlie Kirk Show. When there is a clash on the left between separate preferred activist groups, who gets preference? Who wins? Now, on the left, they have a hierarchy. Not any different than a hierarchy that you'd have in any sort of organization. You see, when the left has a moment of disagreement or conflict, it is very important to realize that there is a structure of what matters more than something else. I wrote a piece for humanevents.com where I wrote, it was literally called, This Matters More Than That. Now, a great example of this is when Fauci, the lockdown artist, the anti-freedom activist, mad scientist, who is the best example of the technological and scientific elite that the left worships. When he was even confronted by a talk show host, where they asked Fauci, they said, so do you think that young people should be should stop hooking up via Tinder and basically having very promiscuous relationships. And Fauci said, well, you have to understand there's some risk to that. He didn't denounce it because he understood that if he dared came out against promiscuous behavior for young people, there'd be a revolution. Keep up with what's trending. Subscribe on YouTube today. Trending now on The Mike Gallagher Show. Look around. You are witnessing a shameful part of, of history that is unfolding in the United States of America. We've got a president who was caught in a bald-faced lie about withdrawing from Afghanistan. We've got a general announcing to the world that we have utterly and completely failed. We have a general on record announcing to the world that we are guilty of a major failure. It was a logistical success, but a strategic failure. General Milley admitting that he was leaking and giving intel to book authors about Donald Trump. This is a guy who so far has had zero accountability. Joe Biden, the president of the United States, has had zero accountability. Let's go back to what he said to George Stephanopoulos a few weeks ago, and then we'll take you to the present and yesterday's explosive, dramatic testimony by military commanders over the shameful unethical, unforgivable lies coming out of the Biden administration and Joe Biden himself. Here he was with George Stephanopoulos a month ago on ABC. Your top military advisors warned against withdrawing on this timeline. They wanted you to keep about 2,500 troops. No, they didn't. It was split. That, that wasn't true. Keep up with what's trending. Subscribe on YouTube and at rumble.com.
Morning, Gloria America. Bonjour. Hi, Canada. Hugh Hewitt inside the Beltway, and I'm holding up a book. It's called The Soul of Politics. It's by Glenn Elmers, one of my guests on the Hillsdale Dialogue this week, along with Dr. Larry Arn, president of Hillsdale College. All things Hillsdale are found at hillsdale.edu. And The Soul of Politics, which has begun to sell and sell like hotcakes, was written by Glenn Elmers when he was a fellow at Hillsdale College. Good morning to you both. It's great to have you both, Dr. Arn. I believe you had former Secretary of State Pompeo up in Michigan recently. Yeah, he was there on Monday night. Uh, it's uh, he's. He gave a big speech, and he's practicing, I think. Practicing? And, and was he well-received by the Hillsdale uh, rabble, the students, the, the polis? Mm-hmm. Yeah, there was, a, there was a mighty crowd of students and off-campus people and faculty. Oh. And uh, there's a lot of interest in uh, the future because the present is so gloomy. So, yeah, there was a lot of people who turned out to see him, and he's... You know he's a very talented guy. He's uh, uh, it's it's not a badge of honor that he was first in his class in, at Harvard Law School, but it is a badge of honor that he was first in his class at West Point. Yes, and, and yeah, so, uh, yeah, and so so yeah, I want to I tell people. I said, I, go ahead. Go ahead. Uh, I'm I making you go, Doctor Arn. <laughs> we have to. Uh, I said. You know, obviously, we haven't figured out how to save our country yes, yet, and so we have to keep learning, and he's a man who's had an opportunity to learn, so he's got a lot, of, a lot to contribute for the future. He does, and he's a great guest, and Glenn Elmers is a great guest. Glenn, has the soul of politics made it into bookstores yet? Uh, I have not actually checked. Um, you know, there are so few physical bookstores left. Uh, and I actually have I, I bought a house out in West Virginia, and I actually haven't been into D.C. Uh, in, in about a week or so. But I do need to check on that. Uh, there's some good little local bookstores in D.C. that I hope are carrying it. But it's certainly available online. And so I urge everyone, the soul of politics, it's got a forward in it by this fellow named Arn. So you two go back a ways, I gather. And I'll come to my plan in a moment. But, Dr. Arn, when did you first meet uh, uh, Dr. Elmer's? Uh, that was in about 1902, I think. <laughs> uh, <laughs> I don't know, Glenn. What, is, it, was it in, when did you start graduate school? It was about 25 years ago or so. Um, yeah. So it's, it's yeah, early 90s, I guess. So, yeah, it's been a few years. Okay. These are old friends, and I stress that because the questions I'm about to ask actually follow from a conversation Dr. Arn and I have been having for weeks about uh, Abraham Lincoln and the Lincoln-Douglas debates, they are both taught, both Glenn Elmers and Dr. Arn, by a, bell, a fellow by the name of Harry Jaffa. The subtitle of The Soul of Politics is Harry Jaffa and the Fight for America. And we're going to get there, but we're going to get there through a path that I've plotted painstakingly in my 10-page outline over a couple of weeks. The first question, which I'll let you both define and take a stab at, what is political theory, Dr. Arn? Uh, yeah, we prefer the name uh, political philosophy because Jeff had published a great essay called The Case Against Political Theory. Uh, 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 philosophy is the love of wisdom, and political philosophy would be the love of wisdom about politics. And politics in any decent philosophy and any classical philosophy is not the highest thing. It's the most urgent and the first thing. And because that philosophy proceeds from... You know, the the, the uh, it wasn't the way of the classics to announce a grand theory and then work their way down. It was to start with the things you see and know and the things that are claimed, and they're they're always contradictory, and you figure out where the truth is, but the truth is in there among them somewhere, and that activity leads you upwards. And because the most urgent question in philosophy is how shall we live. Politics contains the authoritative answers to that question. So you anticipated my second question. I will switch from political theory to political philosophy in deference to Professor Jaffa long ago. Glenn Elmer, what is the most important question that political philosophy seeks to answer? I think Dr. Arn just told us, but I'll ask you that. The most important question on which it is focused. Well, uh, from Socrates onwards, it's always been considered what is the best way of life. 
Um, but that has a political dimension because human beings are social or political animals. And so generally, uh, what is best for us, what leads to human happiness, involves other people. And therefore, the political community always has to be a central concern for anyone seeking uh, that best way of life, that human happiness, that fulfillment. And so politics is, uh, as Aristotle called it, the architectonic science. It is the science or, or approach to understanding that encompasses uh, the greatest field of, of uh, practical action because it concerns itself with the common good of, of all, really, uh, who are pursuing their happiness. So, Dr. Arndt, if you're going to teach a course on political philosophy, with whom do you begin? Where does it start? Uh, Aristotle. Aristotle? Yeah. Well, where does political philosophy begin? Yes. Uh, that begins with Socrates. Okay, uh, I was wondering. You had me, you had me crossed <laughs> up there. Well, you, so it's, it's a, that the, uh, I answered it in the way, you know, a teacher. How do you go about teaching? Well, Aristotle wrote dialectical treatises, and Plato wrote dialogues. And so I, in my life at least, and in my teaching, find Aristotle as a tremendous entry point. Uh, you know, and, and it, it, you don't have to read a lot either. If you read the first two chapters of the Nicomachean Ethics, uh, both in book one, I mean, there, there are ten books and they're divided into chapters, usually about twelve chapters in each. Just the first two chapters, that's about three pages. And then you read the first two pages of Aristotle's Politics, three pages maybe, you've got an introduction to the whole thing. And that's where you start, but political philosophy itself begins with, uh, Cicero said this, and it's a famous thing. He said that uh, Socrates called philosophy down from the heavens and made it inquire into the things of men. Uh, Glenn has a brilliant passage in his book where he talks about the Socratic turn. And that Socrates, there's evidence for this turn in Aristophanes. Uh, Socrates, he wrote a derisory play about called The Clouds, in which Socrates is a major character. And he is derided as Socrates for being otherworldly all the time. And, and uh, Soc Socrates, uh, there's a record that Socrates in Plato, that Socrates made a turn in his life because he figured out it's presumptuous to try to figure out what the elements of nature are, what all kinds of things, because if you do that, you're spending your time on that kind of life, and that presumes that you know that's the best kind of life. So how's that, Glenn? That's well, pretty good. That's pretty let good. me add to Glenn, and for the first last two minutes of this segment, you write in The Soul of Politics about the Athens-Jerusalem distinction. Larry Arn was just talking about the Athens approach. What's the distinction that you write about? Athens and Jerusalem uh, represent the great alternatives of reason and revelation, which Joppa emphasized uh, represent different pathways to the ultimate good of the soul, either unrelenting skeptical inquiry, which is philosophy, which is rational inquiry, or the life of piety and pious obedience to God. And both of these represent um, great pinnacles uh, for the human soul, for, for human fulfillment. Um, but they are different. Um, uh, obviously, one depends on faith, one depends on reason. But they complement each other, and they interact in a, ways, in a way that led to what uh, Joppa's teacher Leo Strauss called the great dynamic vitality of Western civilization. So don't go anywhere over the course of this week and next and maybe beyond. I'm beginning at the beginning so that the soul of politics makes sense to you when you pick it up. But the soul of politics is about a lot more than Harry Jaffa and Leo Strauss. It's actually about a course of study for an entire life. And what you heard Dr. Arn say is that it begins with uh, Aristotle and before that Plato. And I think that's the order of Right, uh, Socrates, Plato, Aristotle, that is conventionally taught, Dr. Arn? That's right, yeah. And so, so those are the big three. When we come back from break, we'll talk about where does Jerusalem enter into that. Go nowhere except over to the Hillsdale Dialogues, all of which are found for Hugh for Hillsdale.com. 
or to hillsdale.edu if you want all of the videotaped courses on political philosophy, if you want the history of the progressive movement, if you want anything that Hillsdale has to offer, it's all at hillsdale.edu. And all of these conversations dating back 10 years are found at hughforhillsdale.com. The Soul of Politics, this book, if you're watching on YouTube, is found at amazon.com. Stay tuned, America. I'll be right back on The Hugh Hewitt Show. Curious about what you're missing in the universe? The After Show? 21 years of Hugh Hewitt shows on demand? Go to www.huniverse.com right now where it's only 99 cents to join for the first month. www.huniverse.com Trending now on The Dennis Prager Show. Women are born ignorant of male sexual nature. It's not their fault. We're so different from women, there's no, there's no fault here. But it is the fault of a society that doesn't teach them that. And, and society always did, but uh, not since the 60s, because they wanted to believe men and women are basically the same. So I'm curious, are you a religious home? Yes, we are religious. Right. So here's my theory. Religious Americans are less naive than secular Americans. I like that theory. I, I concur because we speak of evil. That's right. And we speak exactly. of wrongdoing. Exactly yes. Exactly right. You're a joy. You're in Fort Worth. I don't blame you. <laughs> I hope we meet one day. And your husband should give me a couple of cigars. There's no question about that. Isn't that interesting, folks? Do you know who uh, probably the most ignorant women in America are about men? Women who get the PhDs in, in the social sciences. I would say that a, a woman who got a PhD in gender studies or in sociology or anthropology knows less about men than a high school dropout from a Christian home. And they're the people teaching your kids. Keep up with what's trending. Subscribe on YouTube today. Trending now on The Larry Elder Show. So anyway, you start with that notion of 15,000 people under that bridge in Del Rio. 15,000, okay? These are the numbers released by DHS. Number returned to Haiti, 1,401. Number in Customs and Border Patrol custody, 3,206. Number remaining at the bridge in Del Rio, according to uh, DHS, 3,881. So, I'm sorry, those three numbers that I just gave you are about 8,500. Um, where, where, where's where's the other seven, 8,000? Where, where are they? Uh, and the answer might be St. Louis. That might be in the suburbs of Dallas and Fort Worth, right outside my door. Because this is the plan. Do not let yourself be caught walking around saying, this Biden-Harris administration, they're, they're just inept. They don't have a plan. Oh, yes, they do. Huge waves of a needy underclass pouring across our border so that you instantly need far more social services, far more government spending, because that is the crack pipe of the left. And then ultimately, all of these people are going to vanish into the tapestry of America where they will eventually be normalized and ultimately, of course, energized for decades of grateful Democrat voting. Keep up with what's trending. Subscribe on YouTube and at rumble.com. Streaming on Salem Now. Surprise. Sharon and I. Sharon and you what? Things just happened. My girlfriend and my best friend. 
You got 30 days to grow up, son. Nathan Hannigan, it is good to have you home. Nona, Nona, it's Nathan. Well, you don't mind my giving her your room, do you? Really, though, thanks for thinking of me for this position. I thought about you first. Come on, growing up, I had a huge crush on you. There are things that we all need to change about ourselves, but we can't blame God because he helps us change. Stream on your phone, tablet, or TV. Look for Salem Now in the App Store or go to Now in the App Store or go to salemnow.com. Only up the book The Soul of Politics, the Hillsdale Dialogue is underway with Dr. Larry Arn, president of Hillsdale College. All things Hillsdale are found at hillsdale.edu. His friend and colleague, Glenn Elmers, who has written this book, The Soul of Politics, uh, well, he was a fellow at Hillsdale College. We're talking about the history of political philosophy. Uh, Glenn, let me ask you the next question. Again, I'm building a very Spartan ladder to get people from then to now. What does St. Augustine have to do with Plato? Um, St. Augustine, in a way, uh, represents uh, a good example of what we might call the Jerusalem option, or the, the faith uh, the religious uh, alternative. Uh, philosophy is, uh, as I mentioned a moment ago, skeptical, radical skeptical inquiry, uh, questioning every opinion. And Augustine and the other uh, great fathers of the Church and other religious figures in Western civilization represent um, piety, which is another great avenue, you know, obedience to God, uh, uh, the fulfillment of the commandments. Um, this is another... Uh, a great pillar of Western civilization. And Plato and Augustine, or, or other um, of these great figures, represent these two alternatives, uh, which have uh, been so, so central to the success of Western civilization. And so, Dr. Art, what does St. Thomas Aquinas have to do with Aristotle? Mm, well, uh, Professor Jaffer was deeply interested in that question. He wrote a book called Thomism and Aristotelianism. And because Thomas was the Christian author and saint, who did the most to bring Aristotle into the Christian tradition. Uh, and he's very profound. He's uh, the, uh, Aquinas' commentaries on Aristotle and his own works are tremendous and huge achievements. Uh, Professor Jaffa's book says that ultimately, uh, whatever Thomas Aquinas may have thought, uh, Aristotle and, and Thomas Aquinas and uh, Christianity are not fully compatible. Uh, uh, and the reason is, uh, a sign of the reason is, that pride is a virtue in the, in the ethics of Aristotle and the, and the classical world, and it's the worst sin in Christianity. Uh, he, uh, the book, the book uh, Thomism and Aristotelian, is very worth reading. If you're interested in the relationship between reason and revelation, because that's really what it's about, and and uh, I will say that uh, this is sort of a prerogative of a, an old student of somebody. Uh, I've talked to Professor Jaffa many times about that. Once on a tape recording that exists, uh, I mean a, a video, and I said, "So tell me about this." Uh, inevitable divide between Thomas Aquinas and Aristotle, and Professor Jefferson said, well, if I had that book to write over, I would write it somewhat differently. <laughs> he didn't really elaborate, but I will speculate, and then Glenn can tell me if I'm right. Uh, Professor Jaffa came to see that this vibrancy that Glenn uh, described between religion and revelation, and they're different things, by the way, that that that, that uh, vibrancy is necessary to the preservation of civilization itself. And he thought he saw, Professor Jaffa thought he saw uh, developments in Christi Christianity that showed life and help. Professor Jaffa really liked the moral majority. He liked, he liked the name, you know, the moral majority. That's, you, you know, it was, it was, you remember Jerry Falwell. Yes. And, it's the sort of emergence of Christian activism that helped elect Ronald Reagan and take the Senate in that stunning 1980 election. 
And a lot of sniffy people thought, oh, these people are just so crude. Uh, Jerry Falwell was anything but crude. But uh, Professor Jaffa just welcomed all that. He liked all that. And uh, at that time, and so, and he thought, how do you get, especially to see, we, we live in a kind of nihilistic age now. I mean, it's, it's, it's violent and dangerous what's going on. And it's all in the name of nothing, literally. And so Professor Jaffa came to think that uh, revelation and reason had a common enemy now, nihilism, and they should cooperate. And they could stand back to back. I think Benedict as well thought that. When we come back from break, we'll pick up with the unity or at least the collaboration of Jerusalem and Athens and reason and revelation and what happened next with Glenn Elmers, author of The Soul of Politics, and Dr. Larry Arn, president of Hillsdale College. Stay tuned. It's the Hillsdale Dialogue. The most powerful organs of the state are not merely corrupt, but that they've been weaponized to go after perceived domestic enemies. And that's very scary. Our constitutional democracy enshrines the peaceful transfer of power. We are now all rooting for his success. The peaceful transition of power is one of the hallmarks of our democracy. We don't live in the United States of America as is any of us would like to understand it. We have a peaceful transition of power process. That's not what happened. They interviewed General Flynn, and they did it in what was a complete ambush. I thought it's early enough. Let's just send a couple guys over. And the audience was, ha, 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 ha. How funny to set up an innocent man. This is what third world security states do. They spy on their political opponents like this. This is part of a concerted uh, Russian influence operation. Russian interference. They colluded. They were in on it. He would constantly say, I have seen evidence of collusion. Until this is released, I can't comment. I can't go into the particulars. Russians, I'm not going to be specific. As he knew he could just say it on TV and then hide behind. Well, it's all classified. I can't get into it. Well, it's classified. You can't see it. Collusion. You just got to be willing to see it. New York's Daily News ran this front page, Trump is Hitler. How could 62 million Americans vote for Hitler? Are 62 million Americans Nazis? We really almost thought it was a joke. Like, really, you're not going to accept that you lost this election? Then they see the Russia collusion narrative sitting right there in front of them and say, why don't we just say that he cheated? It divided the country in ways that people can't imagine. It's inspired massive violence. It's given people who are bad faith actors a license to do whatever they want because they literally feel like they're fighting Russian spies and Nazis. Russiagate has been the most egregious abuse of everything that was supposed to have been good about our government. The thing that they were investigating the Trump campaign for is what they themselves were doing. a genius. His most amazing discoveries thought to be written in a lost journal. Now in the right hands, it could revolutionize the 21st century, but in the wrong hands. If you can stop an earthquake, doesn't that mean you could start one too? That's why that notebook should never fall into the wrong hands. There's an old brown battered notebook in my office at work. You have to find it, take it, and keep it hidden at all costs. The, uh, the G20 leaders meeting downtown, they're in danger. In fact, the, the whole of downtown could be in danger. If we are to build the superhuman, we must first eliminate those who are flawed. People are created equally. All of downtown, the high-rises were built on rollers to withstand horizontal shakes. A vertical quake this size could collapse half of downtown. We have commenced the countdown. Shall we stop this thing? Save, Save the universe! universe.
streaming on Salem Now. There's about 57 Muslim states in the world. There's one Jewish state. The massive ingathering of Jews in the last 150 years back to the land is absolutely unprecedented. They say that there's no greater sign of redemption coming than the Jewish people returning to the hills of Judea. As a Christian, I've always supported Israel's claim to the Holy Land. To me, the Palestinians were just getting in the way of God's plan. 300,000 Palestinians are unemployed. In spite of all the years of conflict, there's hope here if you know where to look for it. Stream on your phone, tablet, or TV. Look for Salem Now in the App Store or go to SalemNow.com. Streaming on Salem Now. This is why we're fighting for the soul of America. There's no free speech for fascists. The type of diversity that they hate is diversity of thought. Say, are you saying that race was sort of superimposed onto the event while the event itself inherently didn't have that built into it? That's right. What we're looking for here is racism. Where facts don't exist, they have to be invented. Stream on your phone, tablet, or TV. Look for Salem Now in the App Store or go to SalemNow.com. Welcome back, America. Welcome back, America. I'm Hugh Hewitt. The Hillsdale Dialogue is underway, and I'm actually very pleased with the way this is unfolding. I'm I'm exactly one half of one page of my five-page outline done, so I'm not going to finish on time, but it doesn't matter. I'm talking with Dr. Larry Arn, president of Hillsdale College, all things Hillsdale at hillsdale.edu. Professor Glenn Elmers, Dr. Elmers is the author of this brand new book, The Soul of Politics, uh, Harry Jaffa and the Fight for America. I'm going to come to Jaffa, but I'm setting up the ladder. When we left, we had talked about Plato and Augustine and Aristotle and Aquinas and whether or not they were in tension or whether or not they were collaborators. And we had come to what my teacher, Harvey Mansfield, used to call the break. And Glenn Elmers, when did the modern tradition break with the conversation between Jerusalem and Athens, between Augustine and Plato and Aquinas and Aristotle? When did the big break happen? The big break is usually attributed to a thinker most people have heard of named Niccolo Machiavelli, uh, an Italian political philosopher. Um, uh, Mansfield has written quite a lot about Machiavelli, sort of specialized in, in Machiavelli. And Machiavelli, um, in a way, rejected the authority of both pillars of, of what we've been talking about, of reason and revelation. He rejected Aristotle, and he rejected Christianity. Um, he wanted to establish, uh, there's a famous phrase now, uh, he, he started establishing politics on a low but solid basis. That is, get rid of this idea of virtue, get rid of this idea that politics should establish the conditions for happiness, get rid of concerns for the soul, and focus on uh, what politics can do here now to fulfill our, our basic needs. Um, he was reacting in a way, somewhat understandably, uh, to a, a problem that had developed, and this is kind of a long story, of what happened with the development of Christianity and Western civilization, and it goes to what Strauss talked about as the, uh, the theological political problem. But Machiavelli's solution to this sort of complicated problem was to redefine politics on a much lower level uh, and dispense with the idea of virtue and happiness, which meant rejecting both the high-minded, the high-minded uh, approach of both uh, Aristotle and Aquinas, of both reason and revelation. So, so Dr. Arm, what's wrong with that? What's wrong with the practicality of Machiavelli? Why is he so different from everything that went before him? Well, there's a justification for Machiavelli, uh, because Italy was in a mess, and he was exiled and threatened, and the politics were terrible, and he thought that that had something to do with the 
excessive imposition of theory, both Christian and and political and philosophic, into the affairs of human beings, and it left them nothing to do. And so he wanted to whip up their spirit. Uh, and spiritedness is a major theme in Machiavelli, one that Mansfield himself has some admiration for. Now, what's wrong with it, though? I mean, first of all, these questions persist. In Leo Strauss, who was Harry Jaffa's teacher, there's a great uh, passage in the beginning of a book called The City and Man. And he describes this, this point. Both philosophy and religion require faith. Religion explicitly. Uh, philosophy, because you have to start at the beginning. And it's a tall mountain to climb to reach a state of wisdom. And there's no guarantee that you can get there or no certainty that anyone ever did. It begins in an act of faith. And, and that means that uh, religion has a larger consistency than philosophy. Now, Strauss was a political philosopher. That means he, 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 he spent his time pursuing truth through human reason. He didn't think that was a vain task, but he didn't think it should become an arrogant task. And that's what Machiavellianism lent itself to. And there is an obvious ruthlessness in Machiavelli that, you know, has... And, and if you couple that with the sort of theoretical idea that we should we should spend our time on the here and now, we shouldn't be building imaginary republics anymore. We should work on our own republic. But that raises the obvious question, which is all about us today with the nihilism of today, and that is, okay, how do we build it? And how do we know that the way we built it is good? So that turn, that, that break, as you say, that is a fundamental fact in human relations. And, you know, Professor Jaffa, Professor Jaffa amended our understanding of that break or the completeness of that break uh, in defense of America. Because he did, and, and that's mostly what the soul of politics is and where I will get to. But again, I'm trying to make this a ladder for people to understand how we get to Strauss and Jaffa. Uh, out of the Machiavellian ruins and the ruthlessness, I'm glad you used that word, Dr. Arn, because that's what Harvey used to say, virtue and ruthlessness in the same book. How, where did John Locke come from out of this mess, Glenn Elmers? How does he show up? Because he matters quite a lot to us, doesn't he? Sure, he does. He was very influential in the founding. <clears throat> Locke emerges in a way as a very uh, useful to correction to <clears throat> the modern project inaugurated by Machiavelli. <clears throat> He establishes a much more humane basis for politics. He, he inaugurates really important principles like religious toleration. He didn't quite go far enough uh, as far as, say, Jefferson did, but he established very important groundwork um, that the American Founding Fathers built on to establish constitutionalism and the rule of law and religious liberty. Um, there's some controversy about uh, Locke and Locke's what sometimes called secret teaching, and we can sort of leave that aside. But but Locke very straightforwardly established, um, sort of built a, um, on the modern project that Machiavelli inaugurated, a much more solid, humane, um, even noble basis for constitutionalism that was that was really key for the founders. Now, Doctor Arm, when you visit any of the framers' homes, and I've been down to Monticello recently, I've been over to to Madison's house you'll find a great collection of old books, and there'll be all the books we've mentioned and a few more, Montesquieu, et cetera. On whom do our founders, particularly Hamilton and Madison, most rely from all these names we've been talking about? Well, I, our, our, my, our friend and my colleague Tom West has written a lot about that. You know, I, Montesquieu is very important because Montesquieu wrote uh, much and clearly on the separation of powers. They don't really cite Locke all that much, although everybody knew about him. And and his book, the uh, uh, his, his, the the, sec, the second treatise of Locke, the two treatises of Locke, they were well known. And this nihilism that Glenn hints at, and that I too won't go into, 
is is evident if it's evident in a book called an essay concerning human understanding and that was not around in america but to summarize what they thought jefferson you know who had this tremendous gift of articulation greatest in my opinion among the founders and when he got to writing on something it just became powerful and beautiful and clear right and he says about the writing of the declaration of independence that he he consulted the element elemental books of public right and then i can't i haven't memorized the exact list but it includes what glenn tell me plato aristotle aristotle sydney lock, lock and sydney aristotle cicero lock and sydney so two ancients and yeah. two moderns there you go and that's and see cicero uh, represents a kind of culmination of classical thought and he's the first one to use the the expression natural law is a theme and so there's a culmination there and then Locke and Sidney those are the most decent parts of modern philosophy and so that that's Jefferson's mind and you, you talk about library it's a thought that Thomas Jefferson owned <coughs> excuse me every book and had probably read them and and you know you can't do that anymore because there are too many people like Glenn Helmers and me writing books. Yes. But uh, but uh, it's uh, you know and you know the same thing was said of Montesquieu. I've been in his library a couple times, and it's it's just gorgeous. The books are gone now; they went somewhere. Ty Jefferson's went to the Library of Congress. Yes. But uh, you know that there was a time then in in hailing distance of here when an educated person could have an active life and have been said to have read what there was to read. I remember I when, when I was younger, you gave me a pass or the instructions on how to get into the reading room at the British Library, which is probably the most majestic place in the world to read, but Monticello is not behind it. My point being that when our framing came about, when this country was founded, I believe it is true, and Glenn, tell me if it isn't, the framers attempted to reconcile the old, the ancients, with the break and that which Machiavelli had introduced. Was, is that true? Is that what they tried to do? Yes, they drew on classical wisdom and adapted that, in part classical wisdom, but also you know, wise uh, writings by, by modern authors, and adapted that in a practical way to their own circumstances. I just want to jump in here and make one point about I'm not contradicting Larry, because Larry knows this as well or better than I do. But the, the, this issue about theory, and it is true, Joffre wrote a case called The Argument Against Political Theory. And that's, there's two errors in politics. And one is to treat politics as if it were natural science, as if human beings were just uh, mechanisms, right? As if we're just inanimate objects, and you can apply you know, so-called laws of nature. And, and this is what Hobbes and Machiavelli and others did. They tried to create a kind of mechanistic approach to politics, as if human beings are just cogs. And that's one error, and that's the overly theoretical or scientific error. But the other error is to, get, is to lose sight of the permanent altogether. And one reason these old books are important is because there are permanent truths, especially about human nature. If there is such a thing as human nature, that's permanent, right? There are transcendent truths, and so it's the combination of understanding this permanent transcendence along with the particular that holds the secret to understanding politics. Don't go anywhere. More of the Hillsdale Dialogue right ahead. All things Hillsdale at hillsdale.edu. Do you believe what we're talking about right now? The big issues, political theory, the American ability, the American experiment, the American commitment to diversity of religion and diversity of speech. If you believe like Hillsdale does in all of those things, don't settle for a campus. Demand that they be everywhere in this great country. And who does that? The Alliance Defending Freedom. Head over to HughHewitt.com. Wait for it to load. One, two, three. The banner comes up at the top. Alliance Defending. Spend this weekend spending a little bit of your money. I think it's part of your tithe because they protect every church in America. And if you're going to church on Sunday or on Saturday or to synagogue or mosque or temple or wherever, understand that your rights will be protected for free by Alliance Defending Freedom. 75 lawyers on staff, 3,300 affiliated attorneys across the country, the Blackstone Fellows at International Effort, all the legal advice you'll ever need for your church. Alliance Defending Freedom. 
please go there and support religious liberty in America. And don't forget, it's the weekend, relieffactor.com, relieffactor.com. Dr. Ron might not take it, Wyoming might not take it, I'll convert them. I'll find out during the break. But I want you to take it, because you'll feel better this weekend when you're doing whatever it is that you like on Saturday and Sunday. From sailing to surfing to just walking around the mall. Maybe you just want to go up and down the stairs without your knees barking at you. Whatever it is, relieffactor.com will make your life better, feel better, get more steps in, more exercise in. So trust me, I take it every single day for a reason. I believe in it. I met with the founder this week and we talked about the joys of his product. Tens of thousands of people that he invented it for from Washington State to the world. ReliefFactor.com, ReliefFactor.com, and come right back for more of the Hillsdale Dialogue here on the Hugh Hewitt Show. I don't believe that Jesus is coming back. What if there was evidence that proves that this is all real? This discovery proves that he is coming back. I just went to church to get back to the gospel. Ooh, Superman works. I like Superman. The gospel. Right, right, right. And ain't nobody listening to that. Stream on your phone, tablet, or TV. Look for Salem Now in the App Store or go to SalemNow.com. Streaming on Salem Now. Some lawyer hit a little girl. The community is left in shock as former cancer patient Sharon Blackwell was struck by an oncoming vehicle. Oh, and take this in evidence, sir. I need to call my wife. You've been accused of texting while driving. We don't make an example out of this guy. The public will crucify us. Before you take your daughter off life support, give God room to be God. You're not guaranteed another day, but you have today. The moon. Get back or I'll shoot you. The only one's left inside for the pastor and his two daughters. And if you run, I'll shoot your family. <laughs> Nobody cares whether I live or die. It's bad. I'm not going to stand around and be a part of it anymore. <laughs> Give me the gun. <laughs> Stream on your phone, tablet, or TV. Look for Salem Now in the App Store or go to SalemNow.com. Trending now on The Larry Elder Show. Good. Thank you for taking my call. My pleasure. I'm a uh, green card holder. Have been for 20 years. Thank you for where? Uh, when I first uh, from South Africa. Excellent. Thank you. When I came into this country, I had to have blood tests uh, to see that I didn't have syphilis, gonorrhea, HIV. I had to show all kinds of vaccinations. Uh -huh. um, I had to show means to be able to. Um, uh, support myself, et cetera, et cetera. Mm -hmm. So my point being is that the law is not being upheld as we understand it. And so I don't understand how they are circumnavigating the law again. I mean, obviously allowing these people into the country in the first mm -hmm. place without mm -hmm. proper um, vetting, et cetera, is one of the ways. But I mean, the laws are down are, are written for legal immigration. There are methods and ways of doing it. They say the system is broken, but it's not broken. It it, it functions. It, Greg, I am in deeply in your debt. Stay where you are because I've got a couple of questions for you. But just just a, a just an addendum to your magnificent remarks. The the system is not broken. We totally have a system that is set up to work. If the laws that are on the books will only be enforced. But that's a huge right. if, and they are being intentionally ignored. So 20 years you've been here, right? And and um, as someone who's actually followed the law, share with me a couple of minutes of your experience on whether it was too easy, too hard, or, or, or just right. Um, I think it was just right. Uh... Keep up with what's trending. Subscribe on YouTube and at Rumble.com. America, this is part one of a conversation between Dr. Larry Arn and his longtime friend and colleague, Glenn Elmers. Glenn has written a new book, The Soul of Politics, that I wish I'd had when I was an undergraduate years ago. It's a map, and I'm basically outlining the map, and then the map gives rise to a study which will last a lifetime. After the framing occurs, gentlemen, some other people start writing. 
In fact, they start writing before it if you refer to Hegel. Hegel was actually dead by 1770. But Hegel comes along, then Marx comes along, who dies in 1843, and then Heidegger comes along. Larry Arn, what do those three guys and their apostles do to the grand project of the framing? Uh, well, they screw up the works. <laughs> they do. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> you know, dang, dang those guys. Yes. Uh, well, they, you know, what I think is is that uh, they took a hint or a direction from Machiavelli, and they fell under the charm of power. I, I'm, I'm talking about a motive here. What specifically they did was they took the common sense observation that we are much affected by our circumstances, by how we grow up and by the time in which we live and the place in which we live, and they make that an account of everything. And that raises a logical problem for them. You know, Marx is the most systematic of them, and he's got this detailed, you know, first this happens, you know, and, and you know, first there's masters and serfs, and then there, you know, and that leads to conflict, and the next one is, is the dialectical process. And, like, the people who reduced uh, the Soviet Union to despotism and despotized half the world they thought that history was a science that had to work out according to these rules. <laughs> and, and then you have to, you know, and, and because, uh, sure enough, we're so affected by our circumstances, and in, in, in uh, uh, Marx's case, what we do for a job, that it forms our consciousness, which is a term of art. It, it doesn't mean what, what we think or our sense of right and wrong. It means the sort of climate in our mind that's set by these things. Well, they, they do that, and, and there has to be, you know, if you believe Aristotle, which I do, there has to be some love or good intention behind that. And the love is that we've been victims of circumstances, but now we know that, and that changes everything. Now we could get control of the circumstances. Uh, Hegel, who's one of the most profound in every sense, including the German sense, and that means complicated. Um, he, he, I, I once heard the expression from one of our friends, Chris Flannery, this is German in its profundity. <laughs> 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 There's a lot of work here. Uh, he, he, he has a poetic expression that summarizes all this. The owl of Minerva flies at dusk. And that means at the end of history, now at last you can see everything. And if you can see everything, you can take control of everything. Uh, my favorite American crazy man is a man named Frank Goodnow. And he's in our Constitution reader. A lot of progressives are in there. We read those guys. Everybody does at Hillsdale. And, and uh, he was a teacher. He was, he, he was one of the founders of the American Political Science Association, he was the president of, what, Johns Hopkins, and he taught at Columbia with John Dewey. And he writes this paragraph that's just awesome, just blisteringly bad. He says, we teachers take ourselves too seriously sometimes because we think that we're teaching students things that will guide their lives, I'm paraphrasing now, forever. But in fact, their future opinions are going to be set by the economic conditions that prevail at the time. Do you see how that bankrupts the classroom as an experience? It sure does. Yep. But it also directs the attention somewhere else. What about all these circumstances that are playing on us? Can't we get control of all of them and become our own creators? And that's and a so, realistic it's, And it's so... My, to, uh, to put a cap on the hour, uh, if Lincoln depended on Jefferson and Jefferson depended upon a mixture of the ancients and the moderns, uh, who did Woodrow Wilson rely on in Glenn Elmers? So Larry already mentioned Hegel, who was this tremendously influential German thinker who inaugurated this school of thought or this dogma you might call historicism which is uh, the idea that history unfolds according to a series of laws, and this is what leads to Marx and the Marxist historical dialectic. And we can know those laws. And history is progressive. It moves in a certain direction. 
And what Hegel and Marx and the progressives took from that is, well, if we can know the direction of history and if we can know the laws that govern that direction of history, and once we master that, we can have perfect knowledge. It's very hubristic, right? It leads to the idea that, okay, we know the direction of history. Therefore, since we know the, the scientific laws that govern uh, the movement of the world, uh, we no longer need limits on government, right? We can control all human things because we know how history is unfolding. And this progressive conceit is the root of tremendous, tremendous problems. Oh, my goodness. And we're, next week, we're going to come into him. On page 12 of The Soul of Politics, Glenn Elmer's right. Within less than a generation after the Union victory over the Confederacy, American political scientists, many of them who had studied in Germany or read books, had led us far astray from the Declaration of Independence. We'll be back to talk about what happened and why next week on the next Hillsdale Dialogue.